Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Digging Deeper 2022. My name's Evan Marshall. I'm the Senior Project Officer from GSQ, and thanks for joining us here today. A warm welcome to everyone who's online as well. I know those online can hear me, but you probably can't see me. Apologies, there's a, a technical glitch there. We'll endeavour to have that rectified at morning tea. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to the stage uh, a colleague of mine, Duncan Kerslake, um, who's going to be delivering the Acknowledgement of Country. Welcome, Duncan. Thanks, Evan. Uh, so, as Evan said, my name's Duncan Kerslake. Um, I'm a proud Palawa man, my mother's family. Um, come from Tobrookan country, which is in the northeast of, of Tassie or uh, Latruita, as we call it. Um, and obviously my dad's family came out to um, Tasmania in the 1800s, the Buxtons uh, from from Europe. So um, just wanted to say, Ya Pulangina Militana Ma Palaitu, which means hello and greeting in our language, um, Palawa Kanai. Um, which is um, a combination of languages from our seven la language groups due to the decimation of our people and our languages. Um, so it's being revived through Palawa Kanai, which, which is really exciting. Um, I'd like to, you know, obviously acknowledge the traditional custodians of Brisbane, the Yagara and Turrbal people, pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge First Nations people here with us today. Um, I want to acknowledge the continuous living culture of First Nations people the diverse languages, customs and traditions, knowledges and systems. Acknowledge the deep relationship, connection and responsibility to land, sea and water as an integral element of the First Nations identity and culture. Acknowledge and thank First Nations people for their enduring relationship, connecting people, country and ancestors. An unbreakable bond that safely steward and protected the land, seas and waters for thousands of generations. So I'm the Special Advisor for First Nations Economic Participation with Economic Development Queensland, which is part of the Department of State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. Um, so that's kind of like my, what I call my fun job, like it's not my real job in government, but it's kind of what I do. I would sort of had a background, um, I led all the economic participation work uh, through the Commonwealth Games. So I did, you know, I was there for about 12 months um, before the Games and when I turned up we'd spent $32,000 out of a $2 billion spend with First Nations people and businesses, created six jobs. Um, in the space of just over 12 months we spent $15 million, created a thousand jobs uh, for First Nations people. And it's a really important conversation um, and I know that you guys here today um, are in, in a space where you're working on country, you're working in, in, in a space where you have opportunity to engage First Nations people. And so my other job is that I am the program manager for Advance Queensland, uh, Deadly Innovation Strategy, which is all about creating jobs and economic wealth for our people through entrepreneurship and innovation. And so I think lots of people find it really, think it's really difficult to work with our people and create opportunities, and it's not. It's really not. People make it hard. People make it difficult. Um, you know, and I think one of the things that through COVID, you know, we really learned that things aren't equal. You know, we saw the closure of our First Nations communities due to the pandemic, the lack of opportunity, um, people being locked in their homes and not being able to leave their communities and not being able to participate in the economy uh, at all. Um, with most First Nations community having, you know, really high unemployment, you know, with colonial historical issues, it's easy for people to have that deficit mindset um, and sort of look at our communities and, and not engage. But right now, we have a, a really big opportunity to change things. Um, and I, I say to everyone, you know, the time is now. We need to stop playing in the weeds and look to the skies and be bold and courageous in the decisions we make and how we engage First Nations people. And obviously with the Olympics and the government's commitment to pathway to treaty and self-determination for our people, for voice and obviously the referendum, you know, we as Queenslanders need to be at the forefront and leading the charge. Um, we all, all the people in this room in some way, shape or form or online, we're all leaders. 
We all have a responsibility to create equity for all people, but especially the most socially disadvantaged. What we do matters, how we lead matters, what we demonstrate to our partners and our corporates matters. We need to stop saying we can't do that and start saying how can we do that. We need to be um, solution focused. Don't come to your team or your managers or directors with a problem. Come with a solution. Come with an idea. Be bold. So I suppose um, I challenge you, like in the work that you guys are about to embark on in this new, looking at the new opportunities, about how you can ensure First Nations peoples, communities, businesses can participate in the Queensland economy. What do you, what, you know, what can you do in your job to ensure that policies, programs, um, procurement is, is more accessible to First Nations communities? You know, we are asset rich, cash poor. How do we invest in opportunities to make sure people can participate? So as an example, um, we, we, through my role at Advanced Queensland, we're running something called the Digital Transformation Strategy. And the reason why that was really important to me was because people can't not allow you to participate in digital jobs. There's no barriers. Digital is everywhere. So in Sherberg, which is a community out near Kingaroy, three hours from Brisbane, has been for over a decade the most socially disadvantaged community in Australia. And in the space of less than 12 months, we have created 30 digital jobs in that community. We're transforming that community. And it's about just putting a different frame on the conversation that you have with mob about and going in and sort of saying, this is what we're going to do and how can we work with you around this? You know, to me, it's just about um, don't go in and have aspirational conversations, have real conversations. Don't talk about things that you can't actually impact or change. Talk about the things you can do. And lots of mob, you know, don't want to work in mining or areas like that because country is sacred to us as people. But they want to participate in the economy. And there are opportunities around these things, around mining, that you can actually create and work with them around to create those opportunities. So my challenge to you is make sure whatever you do, Think about how you can engage First Nations people, work with traditional custodians. I know it's not always easy. The rite of passage, I call it, when you get growled at. I got growled out last week by an auntie. She went off at me, but, you know, she hugged me at the end and it was all good. But that is just what happens. It is our rite of passage. They're going to growl at you because they're upset about whatever's happened. And some of that's not your fault. And I encourage you just to sort of take it on the chin and then go, OK, let's let's see what we can do together and collaborate and partner and, and work together to make sure that we get a better outcome. So I hope you guys have a, a great day today. Thank you for listening to my rant um, and my acknowledgement. I really appreciate it. Saw lots of people nodding, some people frowning, which is okay too. Um, but thank you very much um, and, and enjoy your day. Thanks very much, Duncan, and um, I'm glad you didn't growl at me when I met you outside before to keep you waiting. Um, but just a little bit of housekeeping before we press on. The toilets, for those in the room, straight through where you came in and just off to the left. Um, and I'll now invite up to the stage um, the Director uh, of GSQ Minerals Geoscience, uh, Helen Dejeling, to provide a GSQ update. Welcome, Helen. Seven and good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today because our last Digging Deeper was actually in 2019. Um, and I can't tell you how happy it makes me to see all these faces in person here in the room. But because times have well and truly changed, I want to also welcome the people that are joining us online. Um, I also want to say a big, before he's left the room, I think he's already gone, but a big thank you to Duncan for his acknowledgement of country and, and raising some really great points that are very pertinent to our activities out, um, out in the mining industry and exploration and with First Nations people.
So I myself would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're gathering here today, the Turrbal and Yagara people, um, and also those lands more broadly where those who are joining us online currently sit. Now we have a big day today. We've got uh, 20 speakers. We've got people from GSQ, from industry, uh, from our academic and our government collaborators. So you're going to hear all about the great stories of innovation and success from exploration, uh, similar great new research uh, through our collaborative partners in, in academia and universities and, and other government agencies. We are also featuring nearly 20 posters out in the networking space, so you will have seen some of those going up this morning. They've been contributed by the various students who are supported by GSQ who, or who are working very closely with our collaborative partners. So those posters will be out all day today. Um, please take a look during the breaks, talk to the students about the, the work that they're doing um, because there are some really great projects that have been featured out there. And in fact, that brings me to another point, a perfect time to admire the work of these students would be during the post-conference drinks that will be hosted by Anglo-Americans. So thank you very much to David Wood for, um, for organising that. We really appreciate it. It'll mean that we can definitely finish the day on a high, uh, which will be great. Now, I'm going to roll on. Um, we were meant to have Tony Knight here opening proceedings today. He's unwell, um, our Chief Government Geologist. So uh, you're stuck with me, unfortunately. I'm going to give a quick overview of the GSQ, where we've come from and where we're headed, before a bit of a dive into some of the new focus areas, particularly uh, for minerals. So first, a little bit of history. Oh, look, it works. Buttons. <laughs> the Geological Survey has existed for over 150 years. It was formed in 1868, one year after the Gympie Gold Rush. The GSQ even predates the state of Queensland as a defined entity, which I didn't know until recently, and I was pretty amazed when I found that out. The purpose of a geological survey back then was to harness the energy generated by the gold rush, uh, into, into an organisation tasked with supporting and securing economic prosperity for the region, which then became the state. Um, and that was mainly through mapping the natural resources and geology of the area. And you can see here one of the first airborne geophysical surveys in Queensland and the two fine fellows on the left um, the, the guy on the left of that image is actually the chief government geologist at that time. Today, um, 54 years later, we are still here and we are still supporting the resources sector in Queensland. We still work to ensure that the sector is set up for the future and how we do that has, of course, changed. Um, where we're looking has changed. We're so much focus, so much more focused on areas under cover now because that's where that untapped potential lies. Um, we've got development of techniques to help us do that and to understand in more detail the chemical, the mineralogical and the alteration signatures that might help vector towards hidden mineralisation. <coughs> but, of course, not everything has changed. We still get out. We still look at rocks and refine those excellent maps where necessary and get our hands dirty. Creating two screens here, so do forgive me. All right, but the industry has changed as well. It's a lot more sophisticated and diversified than it used to be. Along with that, technology has changed. And I think we could also say that that is more sophisticated and diversified too, and it's ubiquitous. That technology boom has also meant that the materials we need have changed. Society has changed both in what it wants, the technology, of course, is everywhere now in every part of our lives, but we've also changed in how quickly we want that thing. And more recently, how and where the raw materials for that thing were mined and manufactured and what the environmental and social costs of those activities were. Through all of this, the GSQ has evolved as it must.
this is how we define our roles and our operating model now. It's nothing like anything the guys back in the 1860s would have produced. At our core, and I hope you can I hope you can see the text um, in the middle of that that diagram. But at our core, we are balancing the priorities of people, planet, and profit. We wrap that within the mantra of sustainable economic prosperity. And you can see spinning out from there the different focus areas such as data, uh, resource protection, innovation, collaboration, the circular economy, and ESG. You can see that we've diversified from geological mapping and geophysics, though those still play a very large part of the work that we do, as you'll hear today. But we now include, to meet the challenges we've that we see uh, on the horizon for our sector and our society as a whole, we've brought on different people with entirely different skill sets and we've created teams with a different focus than before. One of those is the geoscience information team whose lifeblood is the data that we collect, curate and share. You'll have heard us in the past few years talk about our geoscience data modernisation program many, many times, and you'll have hopefully used our new or not so new anymore open data portal. That work is not a one-off. Um, it's a constant evolution. It's a big job to transform 154 years of data, which comes in different forms, different media, different locations, different uh, measurement, different metrics, different standards, but we are getting through it. Another new team is the Georesources Geo Intelligence Team, and you'll hear from the director of that team, Katrina Bond, in a moment. While the Geoscience Information Team live and breathe data, the Georesources Intelligence Team revel in information and the interpretation of data that tells the big scale trends in the industry. The Minerals Team and the Resources Planning Team are longer lived. They've been around for, for a while. The resource planning team is crucial to land use planning, um, bringing the perspective of protection of possible future resources. And minerals, of course, we help provide pre-competitive data to support mineral exploration and with our collaborative partners try to develop tools that make exploration easier. I'll run through quickly some of the updates from the geoscience information team before focusing on the minerals team. One of the most valuable efforts at the moment is a machine learning project using OCR or optical character recognition, and I did have to Google that, uh, to extract the data and metadata from historical company reports, which better enables the discovery of those ports during searches on the open data portal, which means that this will be much more discoverable here. You don't have to know the EPM number or the company report number in order to find that report. The development that we're very excited about is linking the Georesources Globe, uh, which is the, the online platform that you'll see for the department, and the 3D cloud-based platform, UD Stream, that Rick Valenta and Steve Micklethwaite and others from the Sustainable Minerals Institute have been using for the latest deposit atlases and the Digital Earth project. You'll hear more about that from Steve Micklethwaite, he's just put his head up because uh, he heard his name. <laughs> You'll hear more about that today. But it means that ultimately you'll be able to view all of our data as it's meant to be in three-dimensional space. <laughs> now to give you a taste of the work that's happening under the Queensland Resources Industry Development Plan. In June, the plan was re released, setting out a series of actions for the government to support the resources sector through change and challenge over the next 30 years. Included in that is $37.5 million over the next two years to help position the resources sector for the energy, environmental, geopolitical and investor shifts that we all know have begun to occur and will continue to occur across the globe. So what does that mean for GSQ and by extension for the mineral explorers? that we have here in the room today. Well, $10 million for the next two years for geophysics, $5 million for the next two years uh, for mineral system studies and geoscience, and another $5 million for a new body of work on the circular economy in mining and exploration. And then we've got 17 and a half over the next four years for CEI, which, or Collaborative Exploration Initiative, which Heather will talk about in a moment. And that's on top of our existing funding. 
We've also gone through a, a process of getting feedback, which I'll come back to in a moment. But these are the um, focus areas for the plan, the Resources Industry Development Plan, which are actually read that. <laughs> it's too far away. Grow and diversify the industry. My eyes are terrible. Uh, strengthen our. I have to actually zoom in. Strengthen our ESG credentials and um, protect the environment. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, can you make it even bigger? Because I am actually massively short-sighted. Thank you. Foster coexistence and sustainable communities. <laughs> um, ensure strong and genuine First Nations partnerships, which we heard about this morning. Build a safe and resilient future workforce and improve regulatory efficiency. Um, so back in... We've taken those principles and then we've also garnered feedback from industry to bring together, bring those two kind of different directions together to set up our new programs. Um, I'll just quickly run through because I've realised that I've actually gone. Um, oh, no, I haven't gone over time. No, it's all right. Okay, so while the GSQ is a technical group rather than a regulatory one, we know that investment trends are now driven as much by the, the ESG credentials of a company and operation as by their economic and their technical merits. So we look at this uh, as these focus areas under QRIDP as a real opportunity to take a more holistic approach to mineral prospectivity and potential than has traditionally been the case. Talk to myself. So to marry those guiding principles with technical priorities from industry, Here's a very brief overview of some of the feedback that we've received from explorers um, about our past programs. In short, as you can see on this graph, everybody loves geophysics, particularly gravity. Roger Kant, our gravity guy, will be very excited. All of the flavours of geophysics actually ranked very highly in our feedback session. <laughs> from the more geological programs the um, compilation projects such as the Deposit Atlas and the Geochemical Toolkit were ranked more highly than traditional mapping projects. And everybody really loves the Deposit Atlas, as you can see from the graph on the left there. So full credit to Rick Valenta and the team at the Sustainable Minerals Institute because we couldn't do that, or we didn't do it at all, actually. They did it and then we published it. So well done us. Um, for the geological or geochemical projects that generated new data, it was the work that helped understand the broader footprints and signatures of deposits that helped vector towards mineralisation that ranked more highly. We also asked which regions we should be focusing on geographically. We've spent a lot of the last few years under the Strategic Resources Exploration Program. Um, which was associated with the Northwest Minerals Province Strategic Blueprint. We've spent the last few years focusing on the Northwest very heavily. So this is the result when we ask for geographic um, feedback. The Georgetown Croydon area is a high priority, as are continuing the under, undercover areas of the Northwest Minerals Province. So it's still a high priority for everybody. The outcropping Man Isa in Lyre and Northeast Queensland came in a tie for third. So, again, we've taken this information on board um, when we've just been designing our future programs. Participants in the feedback workshop, some of whom are probably here, were also asked to nominate priorities for GSQ over the next five to ten years and then to rank each other's suggestions. The highest ranked priority was airborne gravity. Again, we come back to that gravity thing. Followed by better geological understanding in areas with little information, um, and third was tied between updating our geological maps and with new data, new mapping, and updating the deposit atlases with new data. So trying to keep those current. Finding the QRIDP or the Resources Industry Development Plan focus areas with that industry feedback. I'm going to quickly run through some of the new projects, but you will get a deeper dive onto some of those. So I'm not going to try and steal anybody's thunder from later talks in the day. Um, starting very, very quickly with geophysics for discovery. Airborne gravity was the top of the list. I've mentioned it several times already, so obviously that's there. Um, MAG and RADS as a must, airborne EM. 
Um, we don't know where we're going to put those surveys. Janelle have, might, might have some more insight into that later today, but um, we know that we'll be guided by the interest in undercover regions around Georgetown and Croydon. Uh, we'll also continue our work in understanding in more detail the geology and structure of prospective regions undercover. Um, we're going to try some deep seismic uh, to fill in the gaps between the northwest and the northeast mineral provinces. And we've also committed to doing some petrophysics on uh, core and samples from well known deposits to aid in the interpretation of geophysical data undercover. Next, we have our new economy or critical mineral systems and geoscience. So given the popularity of the deposit atlases that have been produced so far, of course we can't do anything but continue that excellent work um, in collaboration with the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Thanks, guys. Half of them are sitting up at the back there in the naughty people's table. Uh, we also know that in spite of the ongoing improvements to our data systems and data accessibility, there remains a significant amount of geochemical data that is not easily discoverable through our open data portal. Um, we're going to aim to rectify that. Um, I've already mentioned our ongoing commitment to the Digital Earth project, so I'll leave that for Steve Micklethwaite to expand on later today. We'll continue updating our geological maps um, because that was a high priority from industry. Um, we're going to use the priority of the Georgetown region as a starting point. And we'll also continue the good work that the the uh, mineral systems team is doing on characterising the broader footprints of key deposit types, as well as developing a better understanding of some of the more unique critical mineral systems. Both of these will include continued collection of a reference set of core samples and data from those key deposits. So any donations are gratefully received. To continue the development of tools for exploration undercover, in addition to geophysics, we will continue and expand the work that we're doing with James Cook University and CSIRO and others on hydrogeochemistry in covered terrains. And finally, to wrap up um, the circular economy in mining, which we will explore as a new function within the Department of Resources. To begin with, we are working with consulting company Corio. As, as well as the Institute for Sustainable Futures to develop for us a baseline understanding of circular economy practices in our industry and also in other industries that we can borrow from before we define more specifically a program of works going forwards because we are starting at a pretty low knowledge base, to be honest. Um, that doesn't mean that industry is at a low knowledge base. It means that we are. However, a lot of the work that is already underway with Anita Pabaka fox and her team at UQ on the characterisation and value from mine waste will fall into this bucket. Because, of course, a circular economy is one in which there is no waste and all of the products from a particular process have value and are continually reused and repurposed. So th through this, we hope to redefine the concept of mine waste as an asset, not a liability. Traceability and certification of ESG metrics for raw materials is becoming a key measure for investability in some jurisdictions, particularly the European Union. But it's not just the European Union. We also hear from other jurisdictions, other nations that supply uh, manufactured goods into Europe, but that are using our raw materials to make those products that they need from us from the very start of the supply chain they need to know what the emissions were, what the um, the different characteristics of the, the metals to feed into that documentation that then has to go along with the product that they've made into a European or other market. And so we will build on existing concepts such as blockchain, blockchain technology for critical and other minerals as well as isotopic characterization of specific ores to enable provenance um, for, for the, the in-ground material as well as the processing technique um, will allow fingerprinting of those things. And that's through James Cook University and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, plus um, more broadly across UQ. Um, and we're going to continue the work through UQ on sustainable processing of rare earths in Queensland. I'm going to leave you now with this image of why we do what we do and where we're headed as an industry 
our exploration and mining future in Queensland is very, very bright, but evolution is the key to survival of our sector. At GSQ, we know we not only want to be part of the journey, it's also our role, we think, to evolve and change and become part of the solution in, in collaboration with our industry and academic partners. So thank you. Thanks very much, Helen. I'd now like to call up onto stage Katrina Bond and Patrick Calderwood, uh, who will be presenting on the economic and resource sector outlook. Welcome, Katrina and Patrick. Thank you, Evan. Uh, so given that you're here today, I figure it's pretty reasonable to assume that you're already aware of the significance of mining and resources sector to the Queensland economy. But today, uh, Patrick and I are going to put some numbers around that for you. Let's start with employment. Mining directly employs 75,000 people in Queensland. And in the regions outside southeast Queensland, it's even more important because about 60% of those jobs are in the regions. In fact, outside southeast Queensland, 6.2% of mining job uh, of jobs are in mining, and in some regions like the Mackay Isaac Whitsunday area, 16.5% of jobs are directly in mining. Resources also account for 85% of merchandise exports from Queensland by value, and this latest financial year. Mining was the largest sector of the Queensland economy. So I'm actually going to hand over to Patrick for a bit. He's going to talk you through some of the trends that we're observing when we're looking at these economic statistics and a bit of an outlook for the resources sector. Then I'll come back and have a, a, a chat to you about how global trends toward a low carbon economy are impacting Queensland's resources sector. Thank you, Katrina, and good morning, everyone. Well, it's been an eventful few years in the, in the global economy, and given how interconnected and trade exposed the resource sector is, it's also been an eventful few years in Queensland mining. That dynamic, the impact of geopolitical events and economic events, is most evident when we look at the export earnings of Queensland's resource sector, which is an indicator that we track closely. What you can see here up on the chart is Queensland's export earnings, broken down into major commodities. The two major events that have shaped the fortunes of the global commodity market over the past two years have been COVID-19 and the way demand and supply chains have adjusted in response and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. These have caused drastic shifts in Queensland's export earnings, which are currently at record highs. Over the last 12 months, metallurgical coal was up around 170% to $61 billion. LNG was up about 80% to $21.5 billion, and thermal coal was up around 175% to over $14 billion. Mineral exports were also up to $11.2 billion, but have not seen the same significant growth as Queensland's other resource commodities. So what's been driving these historic gains? Across Queensland's traditional commodities, that is coal and LNG, there are several similar factors at play. The first thing and probably the most important thing to be aware of is this is very much a story about rising prices rather than about changes in the volume of exports, which is why, while we're seeing historic gains across our export earnings, we're not necessarily, not necessarily seeing that translate across all of our other economic indicators. What we have on the chart here is uh, the value, export value of metallurgical coal, which is in the dark blue line, and compared to that is the premium hard coking coal uh, spot price. You can clearly see that there is a strong link between these two. Following the declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic, the global economy went into a downturn, which saw prices drop to below US 150 a tonne. In 2021, uh, supply chains, which were still being constrained and affected by the impacts of COVID, 
uh, were restricting supply, but there was an upturn in demand, which saw a resulting price uh, price increase. At the start of 2022, Russia's invasion of Ukraine pushed up prices even further to around $600 a tonne. Most recently, for metallurgical coal, prices have started to come down considerably, and we're already seeing that corresponding fall in monthly export values. Big picture, it's a similar story for thermal coal. However, compared to met coal, thermal prices and export values did not respond as strongly in 2021. The most significant impact for the thermal coal market has been Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which you can clearly see in the sharp spike on the chart here. This is because of two key reasons. Firstly, Russia was a large supplier of high-grade thermal coal into the market, and there was a large initial supply shock. Secondly, Russia's also withdrawn significant amounts of natural gas into the European market, which has led to some gas-to-coal switching to sustain electricity generation and driving up thermal coal demand across the globe. LNG, ex LNG exports have also risen significantly. Around 80% of Queensland's LNG is exported under longer-term contracts, which are linked to a lag oil price. What we have on the chart here is in green is the LNG export values compared to the Brent oil price. The Brent price has been plotted about four months ahead to account for the long-term nature of these contracts. Because of this lag, changes in the oil price, price take longer to flow through to export earnings than for other commodities. With Europe heading into winter and looking to, to replace Russian gas supply, LNG demand and prices are likely to stay high. While Queensland predominantly sells its LNG into the Asian market, this global competition will support our export earnings over the, over the forward uh, markets. In comparison, uh, we're going to switch to Queensland's mineral exports now. As I'm sure a lot of people might be well aware, Queensland's mineral sector in terms of exports is currently dominated by aluminium, copper, lead and zinc. While there were certainly impacts on these markets as a result of COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine, they've been less significant than what occurred with Queensland's traditional commodities. As a result, that means changes in mineral production have actually had a larger impact on export values than for our other commodities. In 21-22, Queensland's mine production was down across copper, zinc and lead, mostly due to absenteeism and higher than expected rainfalls. With prices for base metals starting to trend down in 2022 and weaker production, mineral prices and mineral export volumes are expected to moderate. So where to now for the global economy and the resources sector? While the global economy initially rebounded strongly in 2021, the war in Ukraine has had, and subsequent trade sanctions, sanctions have had severe impacts. We've now moved into an environment where inflation is much higher than previously expected. The left-hand chart here shows the sharp increase in inflation across a number of areas, including the Eurozone, the US, and to a lesser extent, Japan. Inflation is also up high in Australia, as I'm sure most people are hearing about. As inflation rises, the aggressive response from central banks across the world has been pushing up interest rates. Together, rising inflation and rising interest rates are weighing on household and industrial demand, as well as on investment decisions. With economic risks tilted to the downside, forecasters have downgraded their estimates for economic growth. The chart on the right-hand side shows actual and forecast real GDP. Last year, forecasters were expecting economic growth to be around 4.5% in 2022, but this has now been downgraded to around 3%. Growth is expected to remain weak, down to 2.2% next year. Given that the global demand for our resources is linked to economic activity, this slowing growth is likely to result in less demand for Queensland's commodities overseas. As economic growth and demand for resources uh, slows, prices are expected to ease. These charts show actual prices for Queensland's traditional commodities, with forecasts on the right-hand side of that vertical dashed line. Prices across all traditional commodities are expected to moderate over the next few years, especially for thermal coal, which currently remains at historic highs. While prices are expected to ease, I think it's important to note that they're likely to remain well above levels seen prior to COVID-19. For example, by June quarter 2024, thermal coal, which is the chart in the bottom left there, is expected to be around US $130 a tonne, which is still 70% higher than it was in 2019. Similarly, Brent oil, 
which is the chart on the top right, is expected to be around $80 per barrel, 25% above what it was in 2019. Prices for base metals are also expected to moderate. However, as the world continues its transition towards a decarbonised economy, there will be some upside support for the prices of Queensland's mineral exports. For example, supported by the uptake of energy efficient cars and technology, prices for copper and aluminium in June quarter 2024 are expected to be around 40% higher than in 2019. I mentioned at the start that these historically high export earnings haven't necessarily throw, flowed through to some of our other economic indicators. One of those other indicators that we track closely is mining investment. This chart shows private capital expenditure in Queensland's mining industry over the past 20 years. The large spike in the middle is the LNG investment boom, which peaked at about $33, million, $33 billion in 2013. Since then, mining, has, mining investment has been pretty subdued, up a relatively modest 3.3% in 21-22. This is despite those record high prices and expert earnings that we're currently seeing, which traditionally would have been seen as a signal for more investment. However, according to the Reserve Bank of Australia, Resource companies are generally focusing, focusing on maintaining production rather than expanding it at the moment. Some of the factors that could be affecting this link between high prices and investment include increased price volatility due to geopolitical events, growing awareness of climate and ESG-related risks deterring investors from certain resource sector projects, and uncertainty around the timing of the energy transition and the long-term demand for fossil fuels. It is around these last two points where we could see the most significant shift in outcomes between Queensland's traditional commodities and its mineral resources. With that in mind, I'll hand you back to Katrina, who will go into some detail around the changing composition of Queensland's sector. Patrick, that's a great introduction and thanks for ending up there on the energy transition point, because that's what I want to pick up on now. Um, and. Where I want to start with that is um, the International Energy Agency produces an annual report called the World Energy Outlook, and the charts you see here are taken from that. You can see that um, there are three scenarios plotted there for the International Energy Agency's forecasts. The, um, the, the stated scenarios, uh, the stated policy scenario, and then announced pledges, and then the third one is a scenario where we reach net zero emissions by 2050. So you can see it on the graph on the left. In all three scenarios, demand for coal is expected to decline. But for the, the middle one, nat natural gas, what you see is if we were to stick to stated policies, demand for gas would actually go up globally in the short term and then plateau. But with announced pledges or the scenario where we reach net zero by 2050, then you see that demand for gas coming down over time. But in all three scenarios, the demand for renewable energy is increasing. And that creates opportunities for critical minerals. Here we have um, the International Energy Agency's forecasts for the demand for um, copper, silicon, rare earth and lith lithium. You can see that in all three scenarios, the demand for these grow substantially over the next three decades. Copper demand, for example, at least doubling over the next three decades. Now, uh, it. Oh, we're missing a slide there. There's meant to be a map, but it must be hidden. Um, the map was to show you where the critical minerals are, are located in Queensland. Now, we don't have much in the way of known lithium deposits in Queensland, but we do have quite substantial quantities of cobalt, rare earth elements, uh, vanadium, and so on. Oh, somebody's going to unhide that for me. Thank you. There we go. 
So there's uh, a lot of opportunity there, and Queensland is well placed to benefit from that increasing demand for critical minerals. The next couple of slides I'm going to show you, um, as an economist, I find really interesting. There, there are actually some metrics that show that the Queensland resources sector is responding to this opportunity already. But let's start with looking at employment again. Here, the, the dark blue line is the rolling annual average number of people employed in coal mining, and the light blue line is people employed in mineral mining and quarrying, most of those people being in metal ore mining. And you can see that from March this year, the number of people employed in metal uh, in mineral mining and quarrying has exceeded the number of people employed in coal mining. Now, on top of the 25,000 people employed in mineral mining and quarrying, there's another 20,000 people employed in exploration. And on top of these numbers that you see here, there's another 4,800 people employed in Queensland's smelters and refineries. So again, lots of impact that this sector is having in a positive way on our economy. The way where you can see the focus really shifting towards minerals is if you look at exploration expenditure. The light blue line is exploration expenditure on minerals, and you can see that that's grown over the last year to $334 million a year. That's an increase of 44%. At the same time, that exploration expenditure for petroleum and coal has actually gone down. In the interest of time, I'll uh, skip over that one. Okay, so a really important thing to note about exploration in Queensland that it's dominated by small companies. That's either private, small private companies or companies that are not uh, listed but have a market cap of 100 million Australian dollars or less. So 80% of the nearly 2,000 exploration permits for minerals in Queensland are held by these small companies. When we think about the, the mineral sector in GSQ, we think not just about exploration and production, but we try to think about the whole value chain. The reason we do that is because if we can identify gaps in that value chain and help to plug those gaps, we can create more opportunities for the critical mineral sector, create new markets and some value added within Queensland. This is an example of that value chain work that my colleague Artem, who you'll hear from later today, has um, produced for me. And um, you can see that there are a lot of companies involved in the battery mineral value chain in Queensland. We've got an impressive array of technology companies, particularly for lithium batteries, but we're really excited about also the opportunities for vanadium flow battery, redox flow batteries. Vanadium uh, production is dominated by China, as, and China dominates most of those battery mineral production. Um, but Australia has about a quarter of the world's reserves in vanadium. And Queensland's a big part of that, but we don't commercially produce or mine vanadium yet. Yet. There are great opportunities there for Queensland to not only become an important producer of vanadium, but also of vanadium redox flow batteries. Some examples of some projects that are already underway, mostly at the pre-feasibility stage. You can see there's quite a lot of activity happening in vanadium in Queensland already. Mostly the production, oh, the the potential future projects are in the Julia Creek area. And one of those companies, um, Multicom, it became the first company to get a mining lease specifically for vanadium earlier this year. And we're very much aware that it can sometimes be challenging to move from that early stage investment 
to uh, an established commercial sector. So one of the things that Queensland Government is doing to help support um, that early stage investment is uh, committed to supporting a vanadium common user facility, which is um, going to be built in the Townsville area. Now, the idea with that common user facility is that um, it's intended to um, enable prospective mines to be able to do trial production processes for commercialisation. It will let them uh, begin producing mineral samples at scale. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to accelerate the development of commercial vanadium projects, as well as to promote investment in advanced manufacturing in Queensland and enable the development of supporting industries along that value chain that I showed you earlier. So potentially that common user facility could be uh, expanded for other critical minerals as well, such as cobalt. Um, so that's uh, one way in which government is supporting the growing opportunities for critical minerals in Queensland. There are many other initiatives that you can read for yourself here, um, but I just wanted to uh, use this time this morning to give you a sense of the importance of um, mining and exploration from an economic perspective perspective in Queensland, but also some of the trends that are shaping that sector and how um, the Department of Resources and the Queensland Government more generally, uh, and we here at GSQ, are working to ensure sustainable economic prosperity for Queensland. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katrina uh, and Patrick. I'd now like to call up uh, Artem Golov to the stage. Uh, Artem will be uh, talking on uh, ESG, which flow, follows on very nicely uh, from Katrina and Patrick's talk. Welcome, Artem. Good morning, everyone. We'll look at a higher level uh, what is ESG and what it is not. So I will try to convince you that it's important, but I'm sure most of you will know this already. I will refer to our government strategy for the resources sector and why ESG is a crucial component of this strategy, uh, as well as we'll go through the sustainability frameworks that the companies can use for, for reporting purposes and what is ESG ratings and investment strategies uh, using ESG and some future trends. So let's start with the basics. Um, ESG, environmental, social and governance term is exactly 18 years old term, so it's, it's, it's quite old in modern days, but only relatively recently, in the last few years, it became very popular, and essentially it used as a synonym to sustainability, sustainable development, uh, and how we can see and assess the sector. Um, it's important that we have frameworks that we can, in a comprehensive way we can report and we can compare companies so that's that's as well very important to know these frameworks at the moment they're mainly voluntary so we don't need to report there is no obligation except for a few countries and you know and, and a few areas where there is such obligation and our neighboring countries new zealand for example introduces compulsory reporting next year so that's this is happening not yet in australia but you may expect that at some stage it may happen in australia as well um and eg most uh, recently known for actually investment so investors see ESG as a secret information so we can make money as, at, at the same time, we can save the planet, or how this can be possible. So, um, what is our strategy in Queensland? Our vision is to have a resilient, responsible, and sustainable re resources sector that grows. So, how can we ensure growth of the sector? So, we, we mine more, we produce more, at the same time, we reduce our environmental impact and improve our social performance. So, ESG becomes a crucial component here. So, this is how uh, investors believe we can achieve that. We can produce uh, more goods at the same time, 
achieve decarbonization of our operations and reach net zero by 2050. So it's 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 an important target to reach net zero, but at the same time we need to produce almost three times more metals and other commodities by by 2050. So that's the challenging strategy. For what are the outcomes for Queensland? First of all, we want to see ourselves global leader. And then we have to decarbonize our operations. That's important, especially in metal mining. As Katrina was showing, the, there is a trend, a growing trend for, for metal mining, especially battery minerals. Uh, we want to be aligned with the circular economy, recycling, including uh, some analogies in recycling at, at the mine site level. And of course, we want to exceed regulatory requirements, not just wait when the government tells us to report. We have to to do something in advance. So where do we start? This is just a screenshot from one of the resources companies in Australia. So where do we start? Uh, what is ESG? Is it applicable to exploration companies, for example? Do we need to report or not? Uh, so let's let's start with the mine life cycle and value chain. Or for, for the and where is ESG? So first of all. This is a mined life cycle from top to bottom, from exploration all the way to production and then to mine closure. Is it applicable to every stage or only specific stages when we go into production? Uh, that's important to know. And then the same in the value chain. Do mining companies should care or manufacturing companies only or is it only the final user and, and recycling? So, um, and it's it refers to everything. So. From exploration all the way to mine closure and from raw materials extraction all the way to recycling, it's all has to be included in, in, in the ESG. So a brief history. So as I mentioned, the term appeared in 2004. It was the United Nations Global Compact and International Financial Corporation Report wins care. In 2004, they picked up a trend and it was quite important to, 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 to know this. Companies who do better in environmental and social aspects, they actually can financially perform better. Uh, sometimes ESG is used as ESG plus F, plus financial component. But if from the very beginning, the, the origin of ESG term was in relation to financial performance. If we do better from a sustainable, point, sustainable development point of view, it is often also means a higher profit for, for the company and for investors. That's why it was important. It's not you know, something that appeared from, from nowhere. There were many efforts around the sustainable development and particularly for the reporting purposes. So these are this, uh, the reporting frameworks. The, the first one appeared in 1997, GRA, and many companies report in accordance with GRA, GRA uh, Global Reporting Initiative, and all the way to 2021. So there are new standards appear, and there will be more standards uh, as well as you know, our neighbor New Zealand will also develop their own national standards for reporting based on, I believe, TCFD. Um, so where do we go from, 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 from this? So the first component, sustainability frameworks, sometimes we call them ESG frameworks, but really they refer to all aspects of sustainability. The ESG is just one component of it. So we have different standards that we can use. And so the next step is reporting companies. They don't need to use the standards, but it's advised to use them so you can understand what you need to report, what is important. You don't need to report everything. You can choose which areas are more important in your sector, in your industry, for your employees. So you, you can adapt those standards for your situation and for your company. Then the next level is ESG rating. So investors, society, anyone can, can read these reports. But in particular, there are several ESG rating uh, providers who actually rank the companies based on these reports. And this information then goes to investors. So investors can decide which company is better, which one we should invest in, which one we should not. So, and they can take money kind of out of the company as well. So this is where we want to see our Queensland resources sector being attractive. So all, all our companies have good ratings, they show good performance, so investors happy, they can come and uh, support the development of those companies. 
Um, so what are the examples? So what information actually companies put in their reports? Some companies simply do sustainability reporting. Some of them specifically issue ESG reports. It, it doesn't really matter. You can choose and can be part of your annual report the same way. So we can report on our renewable energy breakdown. What is the percent versus non-renewable? So what is our energy efficiency? Is it goes up or goes down? What is our, um, our waste management what is our water use as well as it's not just performance is also we have to report what are our targets and whether we achieve our targets or not there are different social as well indicators you can choose again this is just examples it's some numbers that investors can look at and then can decide okay i can see you are really environmentally conscious you have good strategy, you have good plan, and most likely you will be, achieve better results than your competitors. So they won't see these numbers and they want to see positive trends in, in different areas. So uh, now let, let's go to ranking. Uh, this is one of the companies, MSCI. So they have a methodology how to assess those reports, how to read reports. Uh, starting with with the gradation. So we have uh, leaders, AAA, and we have um, um, laggards, triple C, and then we can put the company somewhere along this line. So how do we do it? We have a methodology, so all our reports will feed into our methodology, then we do the math, we use other information. Uh, overall, they have, again, three pillars, environmental, social governance, uh, three, then 10 themes, and then multiple indicators they can use. Uh, not all of the information may be available. Sometimes they have to use uh, their expert opinion or extrapolate, and then they can identify how good or how bad is the company. So now let's have a look at some of the results for Queensland. So we have Rio Tinto here and Glencore. So you can see they both have average ESG rate, rate, rating. Now uh, this is for the non-precious metals industry. So they're not too bad. So you, you can see a lot of companies actually uh, be, oh, far behind at the triple C or B level in the red. So then you can see a bit more details, such as this, for example. Oops. Uh, they have a little thermometer. So it can tell you, the thermometer can tell you how well aligned your strategy with decarbonization. So at the moment, most of the world companies are actually not aligned. So we were. We are not yet meeting the two degree uh, requirement. So that's the same with Rio Tinto. You can see some trend over time. The, the ranking didn't change. Then we can see as well what areas they are better and they are behind, I think it's a labor management. So labor management, it's, it's a social component. They're not very good apparently, uh, but uh, you can, yeah, that's, yeah, labor management over here. And the same for Glencore, much better in terms of uh, thermometer. So they are aligned with the global decarbonization efforts, a little bit of improvement over time, and they have issues with uh, waste. So it's environmental component as well as with social component labor management. The same for MMG, another example. The only difference here is that I want to point your attention to. Uh, again, they have um, a low score for corporate governance. So that's a governance component. Sometimes it's important to know whether it's social, environmental governance component where you behave, where you perform better or worse. I will come back to this again later. And another example is evolution mining as well. It's also available. You can go to the website of this ranking provider. You can see this data. You can see um, the methodology. You can, as an investor, it can help you to decide, is it a good company to invest in or not, and why? And, and the same from the government perspective, we can as well assess and see which companies better or, or not and why. So back to investors. Uh, ESG is just one of many different strategies that can, they can use. So it's this, as, as I mentioned from the beginning, it's, it's really focused on financial returns. So yes, we want to see environmental benefits and social benefits, but as well as financial performance. And no, no, no matter surprise, ESG, especially integration here in the middle strategy, shows the best financial performance. So if you use this information and you invest in those companies, you can expect much better outcome than otherwise. Uh, moreover, when investors started to compare ESG investment, invest, investment strategy with other strategies where you're simply looking for profits, the ESG investment shows often better results than any other strategy. That's why, you know, a lot of investment investors came to ESG 
not because they believe in sustainability, they simply believe in profit. And ESG investment shows that you can actually make more profit if you follow these guidelines and, and this strategy. So in the sum of the results from the global trend, so we have $35.3 trillion in 2020 invested um, with the use of sustainable investment. Uh, and this trend grows across all major markets such as USA, Europe, Canada, Australia and Japan. So we can see this trend continue. So investors now can see the ESG as important as your financial performance because it's a secret information. Well, or you can consider it to be secret that can tell you about the company's future risks and future opportunities as well. So that's important to, to, to know. Uh, some investors go a little bit further. They try to see the correlation between separately environmental, social and governance components and financial performance. So which one would give a better outcome? So there is not much correlation between social and environmental. It's not negative. There is a slight positive correlation in the, oops, in the first two graphs. So you can see that's um, environmental, this is social. And there is clearly positive correlation for governance. And this is where it becomes important when the company has you know, low score or high score in the governance or low or high score in the environmental side. So this is a more detailed analysis can help you to decide. Should you invest in this company or not? Should you support this company? Will they perform better in the future? What are the risks? Um, this is for the market in total. For the mining sector, for the resources sector, it can be more pronounced, it can be less pronounced. It would be interesting to see these statistics. But we have a different insight for the mining sector. This is from Ernst and Young. So they um, produce annual report top 10 business risks and opportunities for mining and metals. And first time this, this year, they they call it ESG, before they had different names for this component. So it's number one risk, number one opportunity for the mining and resources sector. So clearly this is very important in the mining sector. And the future trends is that it will continue to be important. Uh, we can expect to see common common reporting frameworks. At the moment, we have different frameworks. Sometimes it's hard to choose which one to follow. Uh, doesn't really matter from a company perspective, but it doesn't matter from uh, from um, uh, ranking agencies' perspective. You know, from comparison perspective, it's 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 good to see common frameworks. Uh, there will be greater focus on emissions, in particular uh, scope 3 emissions is also expected to be included. Uh, yeah, scope 3 refers to your customers, so it's not just uh, your emissions or your suppliers emissions, but also what happens to your products when you sell it to the customers. So that's scope 3, so you have to look at the supply chain. And this is the overall trend, we, we should see more collaboration and transparency across the supply chain, in particular for battery materials. And there are some regulatory requirements, such as in Europe, for example, where we uh, see the introduction of uh, battery passports. So we have to see what is your environmental, social and governance uh, performance across the whole supply chain. And if you are not performing very well, so they simply are not going to uh, buy materials from, 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 from you or from a particular country. And uh, there is also a trend to regenerative sustainability. So we want to see net positive outcomes. So it's not just net zero, but also some positive results from an environmental, social, or financial perspective. So that's something that, as well, we should see it in the future. And uh, we'll probably stop here and happy to answer any questions. Do we have time for questions? Just checking if there are any online, Artem, just a moment. No, nothing online. You're free. Thanks very much. Uh, oh, sorry. No, we do. Would you have one, or just get a mic to you? Hi. Um. That. Thank you for the talk. That's qu really quite interesting. And um. I'm really now. I'm a geologist and and researcher. So I've never looked at economic side, and now I'm thinking more about it. But what I really wanted to know in terms of ESG and guidelines, for example, if you if the government was going to go and introduce a policy to regulate these things, would there be a, a strict guidelines document? Because I feel like ESG and how it's defined at the moment is is 
a little bit arbitrary in my opinion is that you know who who judges what's what's a you know how a company reports uh, their ESG you know how you know what are the metrics um, is there, are there guidelines for the companies or they just sort of do it themselves well there are frameworks um, um, so but they are guidelines essentially so they tell you what you should know what you should report it doesn't mean you have to report they just help you it goes back to the company itself you know if you believe in sustainable development if you really want to achieve positive outcome this is just a document that can help you to do just that but if you don't believe it you know there is uh, that's the the document the guidelines they cannot help you yes many companies can do greenwashing they just they want to know okay what are the indicators we just will add them to the report we'll tell everyone that we are great and if we're not great in certain areas, we will just not report about those areas. So that's that's a, a lot of criticism comes where companies actually pick which component or which indicator to report on, which one not. Obviously, if you know you're good in something and not very good in something else, you would choose. <laughs> and there is, at, at the moment, it's voluntary, so you're allowed to choose. Uh, when it becomes compulsory, then you have to cover the whole spectrum of of the you know re reporting or disclosure requirements that's that's probably will improve uh, uh improve the situation for investors as well so it is often the negative outcome often goes back not to the indicators themselves but to the way how companies report they just don't tell you the full story and investors may wrong decisions just based, based on greenwashing yes Thanks, Arden. That was a great talk. Um, I, I was uh, interesting. Interesting to see that it's been around. ESG has been around since 2004. I remember in 2018 somebody mentioning ESG to me for the first time, and I'm going, "What are you talking about? I've never heard of that term." But, but um, everybody knows it now. <laughs> um, I wanted to develop on the last question, of, uh, where I think it was a really good question to say who who judges what good ESG performance is, because because what industry seems to have really embraced is systems that will allow investors to judge who is performing well on ESG. And and that makes sense because investors, they want investors to buy their shares. And I've been there as well. But there's another group of people who judge company performance on ESG. And those are the people who are blocking um, 750 um you know, basically 750 million tons of copper metal that we already know about that's sitting in resources that can't be developed because people can't get permission to put it into production. And when I look at the sort of list of criteria that that appear on your ESG, the MCSI or whatever it is, ESG list, I don't see too much there that is going to free up that 750 million tons of copper metal that's tied up. Um, in ore bodies that can't be put into production. So I think there's a whole task that we are avoiding by focusing on getting investors to buy our shares. Um, but I was interested to hear if you had any comment on that. Yeah, I might not mention it, but I think there is a, a, you know, a bit of a misunderstanding what ESG is versus what ESG is not. The reason it became so popular only recently because investors started to use it as a strategy to to see what company can perform better. But obviously, in investment, you need quite a long period of time sometimes to prove statistically that it makes a difference if you use this as an investment strategy. Uh, it's not the same as sustainability. Again, ESG is just one way to see sustainability, even in sustainable investment. ESG strategy is only one of many other strategies. So for investors, when they say ESG, they often refer specifically to ESG investment strategy that they use to choose which company to invest in. It, it has it has something to do with sustainability, but not not you know not fully kind of comprehensive way. It it it's a different concepts. Yes, they they kind of um, they connect it, but it's not not the same. And when when you refer to unlocking new potential, talking you know to to the um, to the community and showing the positive environmental outcome, we are referring to concepts. We are referring to frameworks. Uh, 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 you, you may kind of use this starting um, starting step 
but we are not referring to the last step where investors make a decision. So we have to see the whole picture. If we only focus on the last point, you know, financial performance and ticking the boxes, that's a very narrow definition of uh, sustainability. This is what ESG often is. It's a way to, to tick the boxes for both planet, people and profit. It's not sustainability. And many investors actually choose not to use this strategy because they want to see positive outcome for the planet, for the for you know for the environment. They don't care about financial performance. It can be negative, doesn't matter. If you can achieve more for the environment, this is what I want, this is why I want to invest. So that, that these are different approaches. You know, you ESG specifically focus good and profitable. But there are many cases where it's, you know, it, the same way to unlock your deposit, you may need to go, you know, net zero or, or even negative for profit because you have to support environment and community. This is how you can unlock your deposit. But ESG, you wouldn't meet the criteria of ESG. You have to be profitable as well. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I will give you a very quick introduction of the mineral, uh, Minerals G Science Group, the group uh, directed by Helen Dejeling, hoping our procedures today and i'm going to focus on the mineral systems team uh, which i manage and uh, matthew greenwood and uh, heather sparks are going to introduce activities in their respective teams and i will try to honestly try to be brief uh, in the interest of time but uh, it's it's something i care about and i keep talking about to anybody who's willing to listen let's see how it goes yes okay so our main purpose of the existence of, of our team, the team of nine, uh, relatively young team, we exist in our current form about just over three years, uh, is to essentially characterize uh, uh, major known and potential mineral systems in the state of Queensland, characterize in particular uh, their potential productivity, their potential, uh, their critical mineral potential. Uh, what happens about within uh, deposits, but also what happens regionally with the added scale of mineral systems. And uh, this is done for uh, by the explicit purpose of uh, by stimulating exploration, making it sort of trying to make it more effective, more efficient, and to decay both uh, by inform industry, by government, and the general public. And this is pretty much the, the general uh, uh, framework we're using always to decide what we do and how we do it. And so uh, the scale of work is... Uh, uh, like we're looking at trying to look at the entire mineral province, at the entire mineral system, which is up a, a big spatial scale of uh, hundreds and thousands of kilometers. Uh, we need to focus, so we're focusing about currently and over the past several years uh, to northern Queensland, northeast, northwest. It's the area of uh, thousands of kilometers and uh, dozens of deposits up, uh, worth talking about. Uh, but we're trying to uh, characterize uh, scales from deposits and up. Uh, so it's it's in a way it's a, it's an attempt to create up a, a jigsaw puzzle picture up a, which allow people in the industry to navigate at up a, uh, at a scale of the region and to zoom into the place which is likely to become the next big deposit. And up a, the focus on uh, critical minerals became up a, quite up a, clear and obvious, and that affected a great deal of up a, how we do our work and uh, what we pay attention to. So we're paying a great deal of attention to uh, identify what's in the ore. Uh, even though deposits are known for a long time, and it's a uh, safe enough assumption that uh, if a deposit has been mined for 20 years, of course people know it's copper and gold, but uh, quite often it's uh, much more than copper and gold, and uh, the story of critical minerals quite often uh, is about what else is there, and that what else is quite often is something which uh, nobody's uh, trying to characterize for years and years and decades. And it is really amazing to find out how often uh, company geologists mining deposits they don't really know what's in there all because it's not part of the current process and that's what makes our job so uh, there are 
many different ways to try and resolve this uh, uh, jigsaw puzzles. Uh, we can focus on the regional scale and start from there. It's uh, easier for a small group like ours to start from the known, uh, to start zooming out from uh, from the points of interest, to start uh, zooming into the, uh, the known deposits, which are major and uh, we're both talking about, uh, characterize the internal variability, what's in the ore, what's in the alteration, and uh, uh, expand from there to try and pick up the signals which we can uh, clearly see in the ore, uh, trace it into uh, the obvious alteration, and uh, with a great goal to step out and trace the signal as far away as possible. And that's uh, that's pretty much uh, two end goals to characterize what's inside, and uh, what can help in uh, critical mineral development uh, in the state and in the country, and how to identify in uh, multitudes of properties which can uh, which you can measure, how to identify the signals of the mineral systems which you can trace uh, for uh, hundreds and thousands of meters. And the example here is uh, uh, for uh, that approach uh, at the Ernest Henry deposits trying to collect about multiple samples in multiple locations to characterize about what's inside, how variable it is, and how we can, how far we can trace it. And uh, those of you who join us in the exploration data center tomorrow, uh, you're going to see uh, this particular drill core and these particular samples. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. And uh, the general workflow, uh, it all starts from uh, uh, the accumulation of the drill core, uh, uh, drill core of, uh, 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 of the known position in the deposit, representative. Uh, uh, quite often, it's a, it's a very unsafe assumption. I don't know what it sounds is. Fine, I'll ignore it. Um, uh, quite often, it's a, uh, uh, it's a safe assumption that uh, uh, that drill core exists. So we have uh, uh, two explore well, exploration data center and core store facility in Mount Isa. So uh, it's safe to assume that we have uh, more than enough core to work with, but uh, most of the drill core uh, from uh, really serious deposits and their digital footprints, uh, the drill core we had to hunt and work hard to accumulate it up, uh, over the years. And uh, thank you very much to the industry uh, who donated that drill core to us. And uh, that drill core uh, needs to be uh, prepared for further analysis. Not all of them are born equal, and we need to uh, privatize. Uh, uh, we are doing uh, a great deal of characterization of the drill core uh, at, uh, at the entire drill core scale of uh, continuous scanning, mineralogy, geochemistry, uh, going into spot geochemistry uh, to characterize uh, what's in the ore, what's in the alteration, and increasingly we're going further and further into the details what happens at the micro scale, uh, because that's where uh, these signals which are uh, getting lost somewhere in the outskirts of uh, deposits that's what they're hidden. And Yelena Belousa is going to uh, go into much further detail of how we do it and uh, the mechanics of it and why we do it this way. Uh, we are trying to, uh, to put out the results as fast as we can. So, uh, because our focus is uh, predominantly is uh, on uh, data acquisition, uh, uh, the usual approach is uh, to get the data and uh, work with this until we're ready to release uh, together with interpretations. Uh, it's increasingly uh, not the way it's working, so we're trying to release the data as soon as it's ready to be released and uh, to leave it uh, uh, to the outside users to make sense of this all. So that's, uh, that's a series of uh, technical notes, uh, data releases, which we're increasingly producing over the past two years, and a few of them are just getting out, uh, like in either in the past few days or in the next few days. And uh, uh, we're doing a great deal of work with uh, external collaborators, uh, some, something which uh, the work which we're finding uh, or closely participating in. And uh, for a group of uh, nine, uh, we're trying to do a great deal, and uh, it's not possible for us to be effective uh, without interacting closely with uh, external collaborators. So just the main ones are shown here. You're going to hear from uh, probably half of these people up uh, today, and there are posters from the other half. And uh, I shall leave it here and pass it on to Matthew Greenwood, who will talk to you about geophysics and regional geoscience. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Vlad. Um, my name is Matthew Greenwood. I'm the manager of the regional compilations team uh, with the Minerals Geoscience Group. Uh, where Vlad described his work starting from the deposits and looking outwards, our group is looking from the outwards towards uh, the inwards to increase prospectivity across Queensland. Uh, 
Um, so the regional compilations program, the regional compilations group is a group of, of geophysicists, geologists, uh, structural geologists, metamorphic geologists, petrologists. Um, we do a lot of that regional program. So a lot of the regional data you understand, the regional gravity programs, be it surveys or be it uh, compilation coverages, magnetics and radiometrics, airborne, and the compilation of those data from multiple surveys, seismic data, and MT data, I had to throw this photo in here because you can see our illustrious leader even gets out in the field sometimes to do some MT with us. So um, creation of regional geophysical data sets, the creation of regional geoscience programs, similar to Vladimir working with collaborators both internally and externally to produce reports about the regional geoscience data in the area, looking at um, geochronology data, looking at prospectivity of pro-alkaline volcanic units that uh, Dave Purdy is working on in the eastern coast, uh, understanding the geology of the Mary Kathleen domain and other geological provinces, uh, the depth debasement. Uh, Joe Tang will be talking about geochemical depth debasement work that they've been doing. We also look at value adding that data. So recently some work that Derek Hoy has been doing on some reinterpretation of the structural geology in the Mary Kathleen domain based on some updated geophysical data. Uh, that report will be out shortly. Uh, there's been some remapping of some areas based on targeted uh, follow-up. So you can see there's some uh, terrific northeast or uh, sorry, north-south or east-west faults that sit through here. A lovely fault that sits through there. So there's been some work that, um, that Josh Spence and Dave Purdy, as well as Emma Beattie, have been doing in remapping some of these areas to value add that, that current data holding. Also, some geophysical inversions. You know, we'll be talking a lot about the geophysical program and the geophysical inversions we've been doing, uh, magnetic uh, data mergers in the Mount Isa area. The structural uh, interpretation from our regional seismic network. Uh, Don Brand is sick today, but Janelle is going to pick up and talk about that as well. Thank you very much, Janelle. You've got a very busy afternoon with Janelle. Um, and then understanding the, de the depth of the Thompson origin uh, throughout the central Queensland province. But as, as Vlad said, we also work a lot with collaborators, both externally. So we've worked a lot with CSIRO, looking at uh, how we can import machine learning into our programs. Uh, we've been working with Geoscience Australia on the AusLamp and the AusAEM data collections. Um, but in, in the end, the point of all the work is that data creation. Um, so I'm going to leave these up here while Heather comes up here. Um, our recent SREP, the Strategic Resources Exploration Program, and our current NEMI, New Economy Minerals Initiative Program, uh, the data products for those are one of the main focuses of what we create as a geological survey. So there are data elements there. You can scan those to get uh, a link to our open data portal to see all the data that's been released in the last couple of years through the SREP and the NEMI programs. Uh, and we might flip that back up a bit later on as well. Thank you very much. Alrighty, good morning everyone. I'm Heather Sparks. I work at the Geological Survey of Queensland on a number of our industry engagement activities, like this one we're hosting today. And in particular, I manage our Collaborative Exploration Initiative, or CEI. I'm excited to talk to you about our CEI because we've had a few um, recent changes, so I'll go into that in a bit. We hold a number of engagement activities uh, throughout the year, as none of the work uh, that we do would mean anything if we didn't get it out to um, you guys today. So, for example, today's conference would not be possible without the work of Evan Marshall, so a big thanks goes to Evan today. <laughs> because today's event would not have been possible without his work. So thank you, Evan. Um, tomorrow we're holding a mineral systems workshop out at EDC. I think the event now is full, but I'm really pleased to see how many people were actually really interested in the event. So I'm gonna make sure that we hold more events similar to that uh, next year. Uh, we also hold uh, monthly webinars with our UQ collaborators. They have completed for the year, uh, so you're going to have to wait till next year for them to start up again. We also hold our annual workshops in the regions uh, in Mount Isa and Townsville. Earlier this year we were in Townsville, so next year we're going to be in Mount Isa. Uh, we've also held some industry feedback workshops and we had a seminar on uh, CEI a couple of weeks ago. 
Alrighty, so in this June, the Queensland government released its Queensland Resources Industry Development Plan, or QRIDP. The plan is the roadmap for the government for the next 30 years, and it maps out some pretty ambitious climate targets. 50% renewable energy by 2030. 30% emissions reduction below our 2005 levels by 2030. And net zero emissions by 2050. So how do we get there? Well, CEI is helping provide funding to exploration companies who are exploring for critical minerals as we need to transition towards decarbonization and a future propelled by renewables and cleaner energy. And I'm thrilled to share with you that as part of the QRIDP plan, the government has given CEI an additional $17.5 million. This means that from round seven through to round 10, the government is supporting CEI with $5 million a round. So this is great because it's now doubled the amount that we're able to support per round. So previously we were supporting each round with 2.5 and now we're up at 5 million. The flow on effect means that the maximum funding amount an explorer can apply uh, apply for has also increased from $200,000 to $250,000. This shows the strong commitment the government has in supporting the exploration for critical minerals. Now, round seven has just opened last week and applications are closing January 11th. So don't leave it to the last minute. If you're thinking of applying, please get started now on your application. If you want to stay up to date about our funding initiative, or if you have any questions about round seven coming up, please email our generic inbox and ask a question or ask to be included on our mailing list. It's a great way to stay up to date. Exploration is hard and it's getting harder. The next generation of big deposits are unlikely to outcrop. They'll be obscured, difficult to locate, and probably deep. GSQ, with its CEI program, is striving to ensure that these baseline data sets are available with the CEI pre-competitive data being released on our open data portal only six months after the program's complete. That means that we are making exploration in regions like this a, a bit more possible. Thank you. Thanks very much, Heather uh, and Matt and Vlad. Um, I'd now like to call up onto the stage David Houston uh, from GA, uh, Mineral Potential of Australia, uh, Energy and Groundwater, and talking about the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative. Welcome, David. Hey, Evan, thanks for that. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative. And Probably for most of you, that's just gobbledygook. So I'm going to try to explain exactly what that is. So, first of all, I'd like to point out that the CMMI, which is short for uh, Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative, is a work of many. And it involves people from Geoscience Australia, Geological Survey of Canada, the United States Geological Survey, also a couple of people from uh, the Geological Survey of Queensland, and we also have some outside um, collaborators. Many of the people uh, in that list are actually in the audience here. So, first question, what is a critical minerals mapping initiative? Okay, in 2018, the, the USGS and Geoscience Australia began to talk about collaboration. Okay, and that actually led to um, formal agreements between the USGS uh, the uh, Geoscience Australia and the Geological Survey of Canada. And that's actually, I think, uh, six agreements between the, between the organizations. There's lots of government uh, paperwork at the, at the very highest level and basically allowed for collaborative research between the three institutions um, on problems that we see as a, a, of mutual benefit. And as part of that, the GSQ has become a contributor, and particularly we'd like to thank Vlad Lizardson because he's made a, a major contribution. 
Okay, it started, as I said, in 2019, and we had a meeting in Denver with the USGS. Um, and it, basically, we talked about the concept of, of mineral systems. And then following that, the, the Geological Survey of Canada became involved, and so we actually had a second uh, workshop in Ottawa, and this happened in, in uh, December 2019, just before COVID hit. And then there was an interlude because of, of COVID. And then just last August, we had uh, a meeting in Canberra where the USGS and the, and the GSC came to Canberra. And we also had a field trip to Mount Isa at the same time. Now, what we're looking at are the distribution of critical minerals and ores and also how those critical minerals got in that ores and how to find those deposit types. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the science and also a little bit more about the, the background. Okay, so this gives a little bit of a background. So what is a critical mineral? And everybody's been talking about critical minerals. The governments have been talking about critical minerals. So what exactly are they? Well, first of all, they're essential to economic and technological development. Secondly, they are at risk of supply disruption because of limited source of supply and or political and economic factors. As a consequence of that, a number of countries have put together what we call critical minerals lists. And I've just shown the Canadian one because it actually um, plots up really nice with the, with the maple leaf. Um, the kangaroo doesn't work quite as well. Um, so, as I say, many, uh, many countries have produced critical mineral lists. Uh, United States, Japan, Korea, EU, uh, Canada, Australia, and even China have produced critical minerals lists. Now, it's interesting when you look at these critical mineral lists is because you have two viewpoints. Okay, you have the consumers of critical minerals, and that would include countries like the United States, Japan, the European Union. And then you have producers, and that would include countries like Australia and Canada. So some consume and others like us produce critical minerals. Okay, and so we have a different perspective on, on that. And as a consequence of that, we've produced an Australian critical minerals list, which is based on our, our role as a producer of critical minerals. We actually haven't looked at what a critical minerals list would be for what we consume as a, as a um, economy. And I think that's starting to happen. And you might find things like potash and phosphate actually appear on, on such lists. But we need to, to think about that. Okay, so I'm going to start to talk a little bit about, about some of the science we've been doing. And one of the first things that we did, um, and this was led by um, Al and, and Vlad had a very large influence on that, uh, is produce a classification of deposit types. Okay, now you get a bunch of economic geologists together in a, in, in a room and they talk about, and you want to talk about um, classifying ore deposits. You get so many different opinions. So what we came up with was basically something that everybody was okay with, nobody was entirely unhappy with. And so it's, there's a lot of compromises um, in this. And so the central part of that is shown on as a green column. It actually starts at the deposit type. And you can see uh, in that list a number of um, deposit types, and these are just a small proportion of all the deposit types that we've got. Um, so porphyry copper deposit, vein breccia pipe, uh, copper gold, and we actually start to bring these together into uh, a, a grouping. Okay, so we have a deposit group, and so we have porphyry uh, deposit group, which obviously would include the porphyry copper, but also porphyry moly and a few other porphyry type deposits. And then you also have some other ones like the vein breccia pipe deposits. So you have the copper gold systems and you have some other vein breccia type deposits. And then you group those at a higher level and you come to magmatic hydrothermal. In other words, we think these are associated with magmatic hydrothermal processes. And then you go down through that and you say your orogenic 
um, gold, orogenic antimony gold, or kind of grouping together as orogenic, and then they form by metamorphic or hydrothermal uh, processes. And so that's the first aspect that we did. And that's what we use for classification in the critical minerals in ore, which I'll talk about uh, uh, shortly in, in, in that data set. But now we're actually moving on to looking at how these deposits fit into uh, the geodynamics or, 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 or tectonic metallogenic uh, systems. And we've actually looked at this and grouped them according to a number of factors. So the, the, the smallest scale is the mineral system. Uh, if you look in a district and you look at what kinds of deposits that are clumped together in that district. So you might find a porphyry copper deposit. You might find a, an epithermal uh, gold deposits, and these are probably forming by the same sort of processes in the same region at about the same time. Okay, from that we actually start to look at where they sit tectonically, and that's both in terms of the position in a convergent margin, whether you're looking at the arc, the back arc, etc., and also the stage when this actually happens. So you have the formation of an arc, and then you have the a collision. Uh, and something happens and you get an orogenic pro, uh, processes. And so you have a stage which is different from the, the subduction stage and you get different sorts of deposits, okay? And then we look at that in terms of what type of margin you're looking at. So if you're looking at a convergent margin or a divergent margin. So this is the current work that we're working on and we're trying to develop a classification which you can actually use to predict um, what sorts of deposits might occur in a particular uh, tectonic environment. Okay, and that leads me to the second thing, and this is looking at uh, data, and it's a way of getting data together. And so what we have is a critical minerals and ore database, which you can access um, on the web link that you see there. And the map that you sh shows is just a, a world map showing the locations of samples uh, that we have in, in the CMM, CMIO uh, database. The initial release was in June 2021. We have about 7,000 samples in, in the database, and it's been sourced from uh, various sources, uh, including uh, the various surveys, geochemical uh, databases. As I said, it's been classified by that using that classification that we had before. Uh, the data set includes not only the analyses, but also analytical metadata associated with the analyses. And so you know what, you, you can actually go to the database and you can find out not only the number, but also how that number was derived. And that's actually quite important for some elements. The next update is early 2023, and we hope to have more than double the size of, of the current database. And how can you use this database? And this is just an illustration of, 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 of one of the particular uses. And this is developed by uh, Yevgeny uh, Bastrikov. And it just shows you uh, the characteristics in a radar type diagram, just illustrating the, the relative abundance of different elements. And this is the, the phosphorite deposits in Queensland. And it just illustrates the differences between um, two of the deposits, Phosphate Hill and Ardmore, and it just shows that Ardmore is much more enriched. But the second aspect of it is you can use the database and you can combine it with uh, price data and you can actually look at the value of each different element within that particular an analysis. And you can actually have an indicate of what's important in terms of uh, the value. So that's one aspect. The second aspect, and we'll go to Alaska here, and we're going to go to the Pebbles Porphyry Copper Deposit. Um, and this is work by uh, George Case, who some of you probably know. Um, and it's looking at the ore shells. So you have a copper shell, and then you also have a shell showing the, di the distribution of tellurium. Now, tellurium is a critical mineral. It can be produced as part of the... Um, uh, refining of copper produced from um, porphyry copper deposits, but it's nice to know where it occurs respect to the ore deposit and, and the geochemical zonation. And we intend to ex expand upon this sort of uh, work to uh, establish where critical minerals are in a number of different um, ore types, this one being uh, a good example of, of the type of work we're trying to do. 
Another aspect that we're looking at is mineral prospective, uh, mineral potential um, analysis or prospectivity analysis. And this is a paper by uh, Chris Lawley looking at um, basin hosted zinc deposits and looking both in North America and also Australia. And this is just an illustration of this is a machine learning uh, technique. Um, and just looking at geophysical and geological data sets, looking for correlations, and then and then and then plotting up based on those correlations the, the highly prospective uh, areas. And the highly prospective areas are shown in the in, in in the bright colors, the yellows and the greens. And as you can see, there's a good correlation between the deposits, uh, Mississippi Valley type deposits, in the um, Missouri area. Uh, and also in the Appalachians in, in, in the United States. And also, if you look to the, to the Kimberley, uh, the Leonard Shelf, you can see there's a good correlation between um, the deposits uh, and the in areas of high prospectivity. So it indicates that the methodology works and we can actually give credence to some of the areas uh, indicated for high of high prospectivity uh, based on the fact that, that they, we, it's a known and, and it's tested. It's also happened with um, shale hosted deposits, um, so Broken Hill type or, or Mount Isa type deposits. And you can see uh, in northwest Queensland, you can see a good correlation, the, again, the, the, the bright green areas. Uh, with deposits like Mount Isa, uh, Century, etc., and there's a good correlation based on largely geophysical data. The same thing also applies um, in Broken Hill, as you can see in, in the right-hand uh, uh, image. So that's another aspect that we're looking at, and, and we started on basin hosted systems because there's a lot of expertise in the, in the three geological surveys in those basins, and these basin hosted systems contain uh, critical minerals like um, bismuth, germanium, and indium. And so that's why we started there. The other aspect that we're looking at is um, exploration potential and, 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 and metallogenesis. Okay, and this diagram that we've, we've worked in two areas. We've worked in, in, in northwest Queensland into the Northern Territory and also in the Northern Cordillera in uh, North America. And these two maps uh, illustrate the geology. And actually, there's not a good relationship in, in, in many ways between the geology and the deposit itself, except if you go to the North American um, map, you can see actually that many of the deposits are shown in yellow or are shown in light blue are actually located along the bound or near the boundary between the North American craton and the um, exotic terrains to the to the to the to the southwest. So that's the geology. And we actually started this work based on some lead isotope work. And Svetlana is going to talk about uh, that uh, in, a, in a couple of uh, probably an hour or so. And we actually saw, we could see the distribution of these deposits associated with great gradients in lead isotope data. So from that, we actually looked at some other data sets. And this is just one of the data sets that we looked at, and this is published um, in uh, Nature Geoscience a year ago by uh, Mark Hogard and a whole bunch of other people. And it shows that there's a correlation between the location of the deposits, shown again in blue on, 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 on both images, and what is the a particular depth of the lithospheric asthenospheric boundary. Okay, it's about 170 kilometers. The deposit seems to be located above that particular depth of the lithospheric asthenospheric boundary. We've put together some, some reasons possibly why. We also see the relationship in other data sets. Okay, and so the, the diagram on the left is upward continued gravity. Uh, to 30 kilometers, and you can see there's a nice correlation between the yellows, or the gradients in, in the upward continued gravity data uh, with the deposits shown again in, in the light blue. And in some cases, you actually see a, a, an, an association with the reentrant. Uh, if you go to um, MacArthur River, which is um, in the Northern Territory, uh, there's a, an association with the reentrant um, in the gravity data. 
the same thing also applies to Walford Creek. And so that might be another indication of, of, of prospectivity. Another data set that we looked at was the MT um, data. And in this case, we're looking at resistivity anomalies, which are shown in blue. And as you can see, there's a nice correlation between the deposits and that resistivity anomaly. Uh, and this is taken at the 36-kilometer uh, depth slides. So there's a number of different data sets which are pointing to some major feature which is controlling the distribution of these, of these deposits. And this diagram sort of illustrates our co concept of, of, of the controls on that. And this is just a diagram, uh, a generic diagram, which places um, your sediment-hosted uh, base metal deposits along a margin of a extending uh, or, a, or an extended um, an extended margin. Okay, and, uh, it's just shown in the center of the the diagram, but if you actually look at the data sets, on the bottom line, you, you can actually see the lithospheric, asthenospheric boundary. We think that you can use that to uh, define zones uh, of, of, of general um, um, positive prospectivity. We can also use uh, land seismic data, which also can be used at the same scale. So you're looking at defining a zone maybe 200 kilometers wide. This that's probably highly prospect, prospective based on that data. But if you go into the more detailed data, like the gravity data and also the lead isotope data, we think you can actually zoom in a little bit more. And then if you look at strange features, uh, the anomalies within those um, maps, you can actually identify zones that are, each, that, that are specifically more interesting. So we think you can use a lot of this data to um, zoom in on, on the prospectivity, and we think this also applies to other systems. Uh, for instance, um, many of your rare earth element deposits might be associated with, with some features that we can see in, in this big scale geophysical data. And the final slide, well, not the final slide, but the final scientific slide is looking at the deportment of critical minerals in zinc ores. Okay, so germanium and indium are actually produced mainly from, from sphalerite concentrates. But if you look at this diagram here, which just looks at the concentration of germanium and indium in sphalerite, you actually see that there's a, a grouping of deposits. So the green deposits are high temperature, uh, reduced fluids, whereas the red deposits are lower temperature, oxidized fluids. And this has been used since the 1940s as an indicator of germanium and indium have been used as an indicator of temperature. Uh, the germanium is rich at lower temperature and the indium is rich in higher temperature. Uh, and a, fellow named uh, Fresnel uh, pre presented a geothermometer based on uh, the germ germanium, indium, and gallium contents of sphalerite, but fluid redox can also be an important control. Now, the importance of this type of data is that you can actually use the data to predict what the critical mineral potential of a particular ore body or ore type might be. And from that, you might find, you might conclude that the germanium-rich type deposits are, are MVT or in some and some shale-hosted uh, zinc deposits. For instance, um, Red Dog in Alaska is actually one of the major uh, germanium-producing deposits in the world. In contrast, if you look for indium-rich systems, you might be looking for VHMS deposits or intrusion-related um, deposits you might find up in northern Queensland. So, future directions, we're going to continue work on the deposit classifications, but we're going to concentrate on tectonic settings. We're also going to expand the CMIO database. We're going to do more work on critical minerals and ores based on, on, on the ore types. We're going to do some more work on basin-hosted prospectivity, in this case using a knowledge-driven uh, approach. We're also doing some work on paleo reconstructions and metallogenesis. This is being done with works at, uh, with people at the University of Saskatchewan. And we're also starting to look at, at mine waste. And this actually fits quite nicely into, into what some of the work at, at, at the GSQ. And the last slide is an advertisement. Okay. Um, in 2020, we actually intended to have a 
field workshop in Mount Isa. Unfortunately, COVID got in the way. And so we've actually rescheduled that now. And it's going to happen uh, the first week in August. It's going to happen in Mount Isa and Cloncurry. And we're going to actually look at IOCG deposits and shale-hosted uh, lead zinc deposits. It's going to be an international um, group of people. It's going to start out with lectures in the morning and then field trips and core viewing in the afternoon. Uh, it's being run by uh, GA, GSQ, JCU, and the University of, of Queensland on, the, on behalf of SGA, which is the Society for Geology Applied to Mineral Deposits. Um, and it's the inaugural SGA field conference. And so you're all invited to come um, with that and registrations will open in January. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Um, that concludes our morning session of talks. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to break now for morning tea. Uh, resuming back in the room, the first talk will recommence at 10.50. Um, please take the time to look at the posters on display. Um, if you have any questions for any of the presenters from this morning, uh, please speak with them now. Um, and for those online, please put the questions through the, the Q&A or the chat. And we're back at 10.50. Thanks very much. Um, this talk, uh, it's authored between myself and um, Dr. Suresh Krishnan, which is at the back there. Basically, um, what we are going to talk about, it's a really a very big talk, and I'm trying to sort of compress it into 20 minutes. Basically, the subject matters that we talk about are spectral uh, mineralogy, that's, you know, um, high logger data, continuous X-ray fluorescence or XRF, you know, um, geochemistry, and the chemical calculator. There's something that we design, you know, as a prototype to try and sort of tie the two together, and then crudely we'll sort of put all this information in a petrogenetic grid to see how it sort of applies to the um, industry, uh, to the exploration and mining industry. The key sort of element of this talk is the validation of um, high logger spectral data. Uh, using geochemistry, and we've got to be aware that these are two end members of this scientific spectrum. The high logger is Besson spectral, it's minerals, and the, the other ones is the um, continuous XRF, and spot chemistry is chemistry. And generally in the past, these are two parallel streams that has never been in a uh, tied together by any means. And there are attempts you know, to look at partially of the, the two data sets. So this is what it's the first time that we will present this. And we'll I'll explain what the calculator is and how it's you know um, designed and how to integrate the data. And then you know um, we'll talk briefly about the um, kind of processing in high logger, the domain and the evidence-based processing, which gives the best result itself. Well before I start, I'll sort of you know, explain briefly on the two sort of database, the high logger and the portable XRF. Well, let's start with the high logger. As I mentioned, the high logger is a spectral data. It's it's like mineral identification based on the reflectance, you know, lab reflectance. And when you talk look at this, um there are in this um light spectrum, you have this near infrared the short wave infrared and the thermal infrared range. And you know, um, what I've shown here is just an example of the short wave infrared itself. Basically, when you shine a light onto a mineral, it reflected. And the different elements, like in the short wave infrared, the, the OH and the carbonates absorb the mineral, uh, the, the sort of spectra, and therefore the reflectance is really diagnostic of individual minerals. Well, there are two things that you know um, that's used to identify. One is the absorption in a peak or the trough at certain wavelength, and the other one is the pattern itself. Um, the wavelength, although it has a sort of unique sort of um, location, it also shifts based on solid solution or the composition of the mineral itself. And the intensity, that's the peak itself, is dependent on the um, actual abundance of the um, mineral itself. And when you talk about rocks, most rock has at least 10 minerals at one spot, you know, uh, unless it's really coarse grain. And therefore, it's a multi-mineral relic, you know, sort of composite or stacking of, you know, the different uh, signals like this. 
this is an example. When you have epidote, it has this signature, and the chloride has this uh, sort of signature trough, you know. Um, but when you composite it, it gives a sort of com combined trough like that. Imagine if you put another sort of component minerals into that mix, like, you know, uh, for example, hematite, which is a rather flat, you know, sort of a uh, pattern with um, different trough. And if it has a high intensity or high, you know, sort of com composition, it will produce a spectra that's very different. And therefore, what it means is this. The spectral interpretation in high logger is limited to two clays and three silicon minerals. That's the optimum, you know. You could sort of push it further, but, you know, you sort of question, you know, how accurate it is. As a result of that, high logger, you know, interpretation is only semi-quantitative. It's not, you know, full sprue. The next we'll talk briefly is the continuous potable um, extra. These are done mainly through, you know, service providers, and there are two well-known ones in Australia, Mineralizer and TruthGain. And I've used both companies, um, you know, um, Spectra, you know, in this presentation itself. Um, in terms of um, the data itself, again, is semi-quantitative. The reason is that like hyperspectral, it's looking at the surface of the sample itself. And um, that's the one thing, it's two-dimensional, you know, sort of, you know, analysis. Secondly, it's like X XRF, you know, it only takes in, you know, it has a sort of rough or really sort of crude term detection limit. And also the number of elements it can analyze with confidence is generally between, you know, um, 20 to 30 elements itself and less so, you know, for um, portable XRF. And there is this big problem of spectral overlap. What happens is this, if you get an element that's more dominant than others, it overlaps the lesser elements. And therefore, you know, you can get that confusion between those overlap thing. Um, the other thing is that the, quali the quality of the sample, whether it's, you know, altered, it's fresh, you got a dust on top, the grain size, the homogeneity, it's just all affects the qual uh, quality of the data itself. And probably one of the most critical is that, you know, the... Um, the sample and the detector sort of spacing, although, you know, most modern, you know, sort of machine has a LiDAR, in you know, a sort of, you know, component to try to maintain them. But if you get drafts, if you get, you know, like, you know, um, some other things in between, it can change or it's just irregular it's sort of surface. It can change the sort of con intensity of that, you know, um, and it's instead of counting, you know, it's basically counting the uh, number of counts for each element instead of the actual chemistry itself. Therefore, a lot of this requires purging, either A per, or gas purging itself. Next, we move on to the calculator and where the calculator concept comes in. But basically, when you look at um, the high logger, you will start with the high logger, you have a box of samples or in a core, you run through this spectral analysis itself, it produces Spectra, a reflectance spectra, which is computed in a true computer software, and the ones that we use are the TSG or V spectral in a geologist. Um, and the function that we use for this presentation is the uh, JCLST or the joint combined least gray, you know, T means just includes thermal, etc. With that mineralogy that we calculate, we entered into a calcula uh, calculator, which we I sort of go briefly through uh, what it means. And it calculates all the minerals that's been identified through the JCLST in a sort of mode. And there are 162 minerals involved in this. And so the next thing is, is it transformed from minerals, uh, spectra, to minerals, to chemistry itself. Next, we move on to the... Um, Con continuous XRF. This actually takes, uh, you know, fluorescence, you know, in, in terms of point counts, and the, it's computed through the computer system uh, or, or software into chemistry itself. The way these two work is, is we combine them two because this has always been mineral, has always been a standalone that never gets incorporated into, you know, into validation. We turn it into chemistry. 
looking at all the 162 L uh, minerals, and then we had the chemistry, and then we compared the two to see how good the spectra, how good the data is. So. Well, this is the working of that. Basically, this uh, what I've shown here is just an extract of the Jesse LST output. Here you see um, these are the minerals that's been identified. These are the different modes in terms of you know percentages, and this is entered. The 162 elements are entered into this table, which we just created as a prototype, and it calculates into chemistry. Basically, if you change just any single mineral in this, it will recalculate the whole thing. And from this chemistry, we translate it into um, the chemical composition of the rock itself. Therefore, when you look at this, you know, this is the first time ever that you could have comprehensively been able to compare the hydrogen and chemistry together. This output, you know, for TQL is an example that we, we have used um, in this presentation. On the left, you're looking at this are the logs that's supplied by the industry. These are the short wave infrared um, sort of interpretations, um, which is based mainly on clay. And the ones in the dominant pink ones are the thermal infrared, mostly for silicates. Uh, these are the chemistry data. On this end, you know, I have included, you know, the lab results, you know, from the company, where we could sort of find where the ore zones are, which mainly gold, a bit of arsenic, sulfide, and copper. And these are the true scanned peaks. The sort of disjointed, you know, sort of pattern on hindsight is because, you know, uh, with the coal we chose is not really that great and it's so broken. And so the results, it's really fragmental. But you could still generally see the trends across where you had, you know, high, you know, sulfur, high, you know, arsenic, etc. Well, as I mentioned previously, that you know this data is all translated into chemistry. This is the result of that. What we've done is, is the black lines are the actual true uh, mineral. Sorry, um, yeah, true scan results through the portable XRF. And the red ones are calculated ones using the JCLST into chemistry. What it shows, and it's very encouraging, is that there is a really good match between these two, except silica is generally overcalculated, aluminum, you know, and the mafic minerals are generally undercalculated, and the rest, like you know, this potassium, sodium, and calcium fits pretty well. In that calculator, I also include trace elements. And the way to do trace elements, because it is not picked up by the high logger, I use the partition coefficients of elements, partition coefficients of elements to calculate them. And as expected, these are all generally over-calculated, and it's much, you know, sort of different, you know, from the actual analysis itself. Next, uh, we just summarize what we have seen there. Basically, we have from the um, lab results and the um, true scan results, we identified that you know the ore zones is just gold, copper, sulfur with a bit of arsenic in a really highly silicified, silicified zones. It has sodium, potassium, calcium, and iron sort of enrichment at the periphery of these zones. Basically, it displaces these elements in the rock and push it to the sides. Just comparing the two, you know, chemistry, one is measured, that's through the uh, true scan, and the calculated ones, that's the one that we said sort of, you know, going through in the calculated chemistry. We find that there's a real close chemistry in you know, a train matching, a uh, matching chemistry train, which means that high logger is pretty accurate. You know, in, in, the, in terms of you know, identifying the phases, except that you know, there is a mismatch in terms of chemistry. Secondly, uh, that's, as I mentioned, you know, silica is over-calculated, iron, magnesium are under-calculated, and alkali and calcium are pretty much similar. And you know, um, minor elements using partition coefficients generally are overestimated. In terms of mineralogy, having known that these are accurate, we could identify what's the mineralogy of the ozones against the country rock. Basically, it's dominated by chloride, muscovite, quartz, and plagioclase. Whereas the country rock is dominated by muscovite uh, and chloride, quartz, and feldspar, uh, and plagioclase itself. This is a petrogenetic you know, grid that I've created maybe 20 years ago for uh, the ore genesis in this, um, course that I um, was involved. It's meant for magnetic system. 
in a profit system. But, you know, because I haven't got a good template, what I've done here is just to plug, you know, that, that data in to show that between the all zones in the country, in the country rock, that's a country rock, which fits somewhere down here, is the all zone fits, you know, towards up there. And I said, there's a big mismatch, you know. Um, this is a crude way of ex using this sort of data Probably it's not really appropriate because we are looking at, you know, sort of, you know, metamorphic country rock. But this is how you could use the data with confidence if you had confident in a sort of mineralogical and chemical in a sort of identification from this sort of, you know, um, work. And then you could integrate the two together. The next drill hole I'm going to sort of show is another example, which is a Merlin drill hole. And this is, again, a very simplistic um hole with, you know, very sort of well-defined in you know, the all zones. Um, again, on the um, left-hand side, we have this um, drill call log from the company. We have this soil, that's the green-dominated uh, sort of interpretations. We have the thermal infrared interpretations. And what's important here is this. So Raj has managed to sort of define the domain map, which is basically pulling together all these characteristics of this reflectance into domains or regions. And it matches, if you look at these domains and the lithology, it matches pretty well. And that's really good. Um, here we show just a true scan in the um, results here. And you could identify almost immediately the ore zones with poly, barium, sulfur, plus or minus a bit of you know uranium enrichment in that region. Um, so that's the direct output. When we merge these two output, again, the black lines are the potable XRF that you know directly from measured in a sort of um, chemistry, and the reds are the calculated ones. Again, it's really encouraging encouraging to see that there's a good match in between the two. Silica is over calculated. Aluminium, you know, it's sort of you know varies, you know, and it's really erratic in the ozones. Sodium, potassium, calcium matches pretty well, and the iron, magnesium, again, it's undercalculated. Um, and again, the trace elements, you know, it's sort of very variable. It's sort of, you know, um, it's overcalculated in some cases, and some matches pretty well. Just to summarize, you know, the oil from that, you know, moline, it's basically moline, barium, strontium, you know, in a sort of complex zones with alkalis enrichment, iron, you know, um, calcium, magnesium, rubidium, strontium are slightly enriched on the periphery of the zones. And the compare, you know, just for this comparison, you know, the silica, aluminum, uh, silica is overcalculated, aluminum is pretty erratic, and magnesium and most mafic are undercalculated. And um, the minor elements, as I mentioned, you know, it's generally overcalculated. In terms of mineralogy, with confidence, uh, we could say that, you know, um, they are um, dominated, you know, the ozone is dominated by carbonates, muscovite, chloride, and k bar plus quartz. And the country rock is mainly chloride, montelloride, carbonates, etc. Um, there's one thing that we have to point out is this. In all these computations, the aspect, uh, as spectral, which is things that they can't identify, do compromise the quality of the results itself. And again, this is a crude way of, you know, representing these results, you know, and again, this is not, you know, it's a magmatic, you know, sort of petrogenetic grid. You could see a big difference between the O and the um, the um, country rock zones itself. And um, next we move on to um, just a brief words about different processing methods. Well, the data that you see from the high logger could be interpreted or uh, could be processed differently. There's two ways that we have tried. One is just the software sort of calculation using the JCLSC calculation. And the other one, it's using the quartz reference in a sort of calculation. And you could see that based on the two different sort of, you know, um, processing, there is a big mismatch, you know, um, in the quartz. And basically the reference interpretation is much more accurate. Because this is just quartz, it means that, you know, you get more, less quartz, and it bumps up all the other elements. It's not a surprise. What I've shown here is this. On the right-hand side is that, you know, you could work with this data by looking at, you know, elements or ratios that doesn't include, you know, uh, silica in this case. So, like, aluminous or the alkaline, in you know, a sort of index, which doesn't use alumina um, that at all. And 
the other thing that we know that you know the um, those kinds of indices are pretty reliable because it's not affected by the um, sort of you know um, mineral species that we sort of excluded. You could compare the black lines are the ones that's actually analyzed, and the red lines are the ones that do, that's calculated. And you could see there's quite a big difference between the um, indices, between the calculated and the measured ones. It's things like this that you could sort of pinpoint areas that has a big difference, like in this region, that needs to be further looked at. In terms of, you know, the um, interpretation, high logger interpretation itself. To conclude, high logger and portable XRF are high value database itself. There are used to be two different data sets, and this is the first time that we could cross-validate these two data using a methodology. And <coughs> integrating these kind of, you know, interpretations is really important because it gives you confidence to know that the data that you look at aren't real, and then to sort of move forward with exploration or in, in exploration uh, regime, we said, you know that this are real, but you have to sort of cross-validate it with further uh, observations like pedography, drill hole log, as I did before, and this would definitely help you with you know successes in exploration. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Joe. We've got time for one quick question. If we do have any one in the back corner, I'll just get over there. Get him. Yeah, yeah Mike. So, uh, Joe, the um, the XRF scanners, uh, is the survey hosting any of those at the moment, like at Brisbane or Manizer? Mineralizer yes. or TrueScan? I think, you know, that's part of the data release that Lud has just mentioned. It will be released. No, yes. I mean, uh, in terms of the those those actual instruments, the... Uh, we don't have that instrument. We are going to, uh, we've done this through contractors. Okay, no yeah. worries. Thanks very much, Joe. Thank you. Uh, next to speak, we have Elena from GSQ. Uh, Elena is the principal geochemist, and we'll be speaking about GSQ zooming from macro to micro analytical. Welcome, Elena. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so today in my talk, I will be focusing on the reference collection project, which is one of our many GSQ NEMI uh, project in this program. So thank you to Helen and Vlad. They briefly mentioned about this NEMI project. And um, so I'm talking about this uh, particular project, which is focused on the um, characteristics of the um, Oops. Let's go back. So, which we are looking to um, characterize um, uh, the major uh, deposits and the uh, major uh, mineral system in Mount Isa province, collecting the uh, represent representative cause and all the relevant geological information for these deposits. So, um, just to briefly uh, overview what are these main families of the deposits in uh, Mount Isa province, just uh, I'll just listing them and showing where we're located on the map. Just to um, just to clarify that the names I put in the quotes because we are not inferring any genetic relationship, but just to give you the broad summary of of those deposits, IOCGs highlighted in black, sedimentary hosted Mount Isa copper style. We have zinc lead sedex, um, silver lead zinc BHP, uh, broken hill type, and um, phosphoritous deposits um, in, in this region. So, go forward. Yep. So in this uh, in this presentation, I would just like to go through our 
stages of the working on the project and uh, starting from the uh, acquisition of the core where the company probably our champion in collecting, working with the companies and just bringing this core that we can actually work on and we can sample down to the um, continuous scanning using uh, hyperspectral uh, technique including higher logo, mineralizer, true scan and um, zooming into the uh, looking at the whole geochemistry and then further zooming into the uh, microanalytical study on trace elements, isotopes and so on. So I will just bring my presentation looking through the uh, through the larger scale in zooming into the our motivations and need to uh, look into the microanalytical work. And um, just to bring up our um, uh, the most recent data release, which is happening about right now, and I think it will be available on the GSQ Open Portal in the next few days. This is the data uh, for the uh, for the lead, zinc, and copper deposits in Mount Isa area, and reporting the uh, hyperspectral and the whole rock geochemistry data. So in this package, we are focusing on the three major mineral systems of the um, of the uh, Mount Isa area out of these fives I, I, uh, I showed in the previous slide. So what we've done, we, uh, we collected uh, uh, current a collection of the deposits covers over 14 different deposits. So we have uh, 69 drill cores available for us to look and study in our core facilities. Uh, 54 of those were high log scanned. Uh, we have some of these uh, drill calls also uh, done using continuous mineralizer scanning. Over 1,700 samples were collected and they were collected not only to perform our whole rock uh, geochemistry but also keep in our collection for future microanalytical work. Well, um, if you, uh, in a few days when the, um, our technical notes will be available, you will see we have a table where we list all these deposits we are looking at uh, with the relevant information on drill calls and what the analytical work was done on individual drill calls and number of the samples and so on. So I, I wanted to uh, start from the high logo, and I'm very grateful to Joseph, who did such a great introduction to high logo, which will save me a little bit of time um, to talk about the technique and how it works, but mainly to emphasize that we can identify quite a uh, large range of the uh, common rock forming minerals using the high logo data, but not only those. It's capable to identify some rare, relatively rare and accessory minerals, such as, uh, for example, tourmaline or apatite, which is very useful. And also, um, at the same time, uh, we collect... Uh, we collect high resolution uh, digital photographs of scan or which is very useful particularly if some of this core is gone back to the industry or was used for the um, uh, whole rock analysis and so on so on well, and this is just example of this summary plots where we're using the high logger. And because this is, was my first time using the high logger data uh, since I joined the GSQ team only a year ago, I can't emphasize enough of usefulness of this information when you're doing the sampling of the, of the core. Because uh, having uh, all these uh, very distinct intervals with the distinct mineral uh, uh, composition, you can easily identify the lithological boundaries. So there is much less chance to uh, not sample some important intervals. 
but also um, it's very important in terms of identifying some zone of alterations and in some mineralization uh, systems it's very critical to identify these areas for example here I highlighted the area where the, we have the albite and K feldspar alterations so if if your first time and you're looking all at the uh, drill core trays so try to ask yourself the question which out of these two uh, drill core trays would represent the um, alteration which one is albite which one is k feldspar or any so if i put this uh, tray course in the uh, in the same drill core uh, summary diagram, you can see this one is representing this albite alteration uh, interval, it's just in the middle of it. And the next one, which you I would probably easily miss without having the high logger data, this is this is K files per alteration form. And it could be very important when these zones are. Um, it, uh, you know, critical to uh, make sure we sample them and we notice them, but they are relatively short intervals, easy to miss. Or in the areas where, for example, in this pigment uh, uh, drill core, we can see the interval, which is relatively narrow, but look, they dominated by these uh, relatively rare minerals. It's a, a granite, granites there, uh, and there um, uh, and there are some appetites in a good amount. But look at the at the images of the core how easy it is to miss this is interval. And this is critical when we are thinking about sampling for microanalytical um, work where we, these minerals are very important when we're thinking about future um, isotopic study, uh, trace element works, uranium lead dating. It's, it's something I really enjoy to work on um, just to see this possibility, not to miss these important intervals. So our sampling flow in this sense, we heavily rely on this uh, high logger data for our sampling, but also very useful to have uh, the industry reports where we have a hints on some anomaly and some useful data. But also we try to do our, our sampling consistent in terms of spacing, uh, depending what we're dealing with the mineralization interval alteration or when we sample and just uniform host strokes. And also we take in comparable uh, weight of samples and uh, lengths and uh, make sure we have su sufficient sets of samples for future microanalytical work. So this is the sampling I'm talking in terms of, of our whole work, geochemical work. So if you If we go uh, and talk about this whole rock geochemistry as our next step. So we are uh, looking at the two sets of the analytical um, methods we're using. So the one is which commonly used in the industry, relatively short, um, the, uh, uh, short standard set. And also we're using more extended, comprehensive, more comprehensive uh, list, which extend the number of elements up to 67 elements. And we do it uh, with uh, thinking that we have to cover these critical elements or critical metals, where how we call them. So some of them are more challenging in terms of their um, amounts and in terms of their analytical procedure to get the uh, precise um, information on them. So now I just uh, would like to show you a couple of diagrams which show the um, uh, geochemical signatures of the studied um, zinc, lead, silver, and copper deposits. So they uh, on this diagram they highlighted in the different colors. But also I want to emphasize so this uh, diagram presents only the uh, the samples which which significant. Uh, um, 
ore component. You can see the cutoff of uh, copper, lead, zinc over 1,000 ppm, cobalt, molybdenum, and silver um, in the, uh, the relevant ppm levels. Also, we organize the elements in the order of the significance in this ore. And I also to point out that uh, where they, they normalize to the um, average crustal, earth crustal values. So where these values exceed uh, the 100 times, uh, I highlighted them in bold, where they have between 10 and 100 times of average crustal values they just listed, and those up to 10 times they're shown in brackets. So you can obviously see the quite a contrasting geochemical signature for these different types of deposits. And also, if you look looking at the critical metals, you can. If you look at the cobalt, for example, uh, it's uh, it's clear that uh, that Mount Isa copper style deposits are probably more promising for for these uh, elements. While, for example, the the um, cadmium will look in more in in the uh, zinc lead sedex uh, style of deposits. Well, uh, very interesting uh, to see that um, the distribution of rares uh, have a very uh, interesting feature in the uh, uh, lead, zinc, um, silver, broken hill type with this very strongly pronounced uh, positive europium anomaly. So it would be interesting to get um, more um, more information and more study to see why that's happening with this particular family of deposits. Well, the next, what I want to show you, that even within the same family of the deposits, they have a quite a wide range of the concentration in the, um, in the trace elements and critical metals, uh, between the different deposits and you can see it's often they have a very unique uh, signatures and the same we can say about the zinc lead and similar um, and similar signature we can um, talk about on the variation and, and variation amount and the dominance in the beach uh, broken hill uh, type of deposits well, we can identify some uh, key um, some uh, key geochemical signature of these deposits, and also talk about the potential uh, products of the critical metals. But what I want to emphasize that this variation and this significant difference is one of the key motivation for us to look at, into the microanalytical work so we can better understand of distribution of these critical metals, uh, thinking about what the major host, um, host mineral phases, what the mineral paragenesis, and also microanalytical work, this is a uh, much better way to look at the and study the isotopic signatures, geochronology, and all other detail work which provide us an exploration industry with a better understanding of the uh, mineral system, um, genesis, evolution, overprinting, whatever you have in your task to uh, to uh, talk and uh, think about the generation of these uh, systems. Well, and just when we zoom into this microanalytical uh, scale, I just listed some of the methods we, which we are using, uh, starting with Maya X-ray imaging, which is very uh, good because we can uh, look at the quite a larger samples, so sometimes to 30, 50 centimeters on the core samples, and we have a wonderful imaging of distribution of different elements, which 
which give us a very good uh, textual, structural information and context. We also doing a TIMA work, which is on a smaller scale because we using the thin section and the uh, standard 25 millimeters uh, mounts, and it gives a wonderful images. You know where we can look on the back scattered and and uh, face and face maps and so on. We can then zoom into the electron probe analysis. We can do the laser ablation work. We can. Uh, uh, using these maps and navigating through the samples where we have all the petrographical context. So our data, which is coming from microanalytical work, is really uh, put in context. So how we do all this? And what I should mention, I forgot, this is techniques which are not, uh, we are using already now, uh, using our collaboration links, and, uh, and we are not limiting ourselves only to these techniques. We are open to try different methods and modern te techniques. We are thinking now to try, for example, Tornado and Libs and so on. So if you have an idea of what we can try to resolve our uh, problems and our um, advance our microanalytical studies, please let us know. But this is just a, a list of our current collaborators and colleagues which are working in, in the uh, different aspects of microanalytical work. Well, and just to present some details, uh, a couple of slides where we do our own uh, team of work, I would just uh, show a couple of slides just to give you just a feeling of the details we get in with the team of work. This is uh, uh, you can see the scale, it's just a petrographic slide, but we're getting information, very high quality resolution, backscattered images, we can produce elemental maps, and we can choose what elements we want to show on this map. This could be one, two, three, five elements. It's up to us what we can create. And mineral phase map, which is a challenging task because we started to develop our own library of minerals, which sometimes is challenging looking at the different deposit styles and some very complex and challenging minerals to identify. This is another example where we, we're using just standard uh, um, mount with 25 millimeters mount, but you can see what detail we have. For example, here we have uh, pyrite, which is probably replacing the former uh, tourmaline uh, Vein. And this is actually the sample which is taken from this pegmatite core, which I showed in the very beginning, where this near interval where we have this, uh, uh, we have the area or where we have uh, appetite and uh, um, and also we have grind. Uh, we have um, some garnets. Actually, it's this one from this particular interval. And you can see in green, this is phosphorus distribution. In blue, this is our appetite. And red here is our um, garnets. Well, I think um, this is the summary diagram just to uh, summarize aspect of our work from coming from the macro to micro scale. And I think I should thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions now or during lunch break. That was great. Thanks so much, Elena. Time for one quick question. Is if there's a question from the floor or a question online, we can take one. No, three. Thank you again. Next up, we have Patrice de Caritat, uh, who will be presenting the Heavy Mineral Map of Australia project, second partial data release, the Barclay, Isa, Georgetown region, region. Welcome. Seven. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, welcome and good morning. Uh, so yes, I will present uh, to you the latest results of our Heavy Mineral Map of Australia project, HMMA. Um, and I will uh, talk about uh, why we look at heavy minerals, uh, what the project consists of, uh, the big region, which is Barclay Eyes at Georgetown, which is the release that we are releasing today, 
and some conclusions and acknowledgements. It was a COVID project, lots of meeting online. Uh, so why heavy minerals? Well, we define heavy minerals as those that have a specific gravity greater than 2.9. They're commonly, but not always, resistant to mechanical and chemical weathering. Uh, as a result, they can survive quite long in the weathering transport deposition cycle, and they can also be diagnostic of certain geological environments. Uh, using heavy minerals is a well-established exploration method in many countries in, in, around the world, but we feel it's underutilized in Australia. Here are some nice images on the right. Um, and they have been used uh, elsewhere for exploration for gold, diamonds, uh, mineral sands, nickel, copper, etc. The list goes on of the commodities that it's been used for. Here's an example from Canada where we have a, mi a heavy mineral footprint uh, dispersion pattern from uh, the ice transport. And so there are, we know, we are aware, we're all aware in this room that there are industry-owned uh, uh, heavy mineral data sets in Australia, but there, there are very few large-scale, uh, pre-competitive, publicly available uh, heavy minerals, and we hope that this project will remediate that uh, lack. So how were, were we able to do this project in two years? Uh, essentially, we combined the opportunity of having a well-established method that hasn't been used here with the fact that we had a sample archive in-house at Geoscience Australia from the National Geochemical Survey of Australia, NGSA, I'll use as an acronym, which sampled 81% of Australia uh, in collaboration with all the state geological surveys. Essentially, we defined large catchments, about 5,000 square kilometres uh, over the whole of the country, and we took one sample at the bottom of that catchment, uh, both top and bottom, and we... Uh, the idea was that, that that's a good place to have an average of the most important rocks and soils that are weathered and transported in each catchment. And for this uh, HMMA uh, project, we used the bottom uh, sample, so which comes from a depth on average from 60 to 80 centimeters depth below the surface, and we used a greater than 75 micron fraction to uh, eliminate or minimize the amount of aeolian stuff in it. The methods consisted of taking a bulk sample that we had uh, prepared in the, in the workflow of the NGSA for mineral analysis, and so we labeled them XRD. We didn't know that we were going to do a heavy mineral sample on that. Uh, we are also doing XRD, by the way, but that's another project. From that bulk sample, we then separate the 75 to 430 micron grain size fraction. We use uh, dense liquids to separate the heavy minerals, and we combine the liquid nitrogen uh, innovation to... Uh, uh, accelerate the uh, the separation without loss of heavy minerals, uh, which has been very uh, very important in uh, being able to make this project uh, come to fruition so quickly. Uh, we then mount the heavy mineral concentrate HMC on a 25 millimeter epoxy puck or mount, uh, which also contains a reference frame. So there is a laser here. It contains a square uh, reference frame, so basically a, a 3D printed frame that will allow a uh, future return to certain grains for uh, mineral analysis of, uh, you know, microanalysis that could be done. And on the reverse of that frame, we also have a QR code and a sample label number. If you, if you put that QR code on your phone, you can find metadata about the sample, including a map of where it's from. Um, we then use the TEMA that was introduced in the previous talk. And we compare the uh, energy dispersive spectra with a library and we customize the library. We have heavily customized the library to uh, our conditions, the Australian conditions and those particular heavy mineral assemblages. And we, we analyze tens of thousands of uh, grains per mount. And here's an example of a uh, mineral map or panorama from the TEMA for the whole uh, puck. So that's 25 millimeter diameter, this distance there. Okay, so uh, here's uh, one of those QR codes at the back of the sample, and here's the kind of metadata that you get when you point your phone at it. Here's an email, image of the TEMA, and again, another mineral mineralogical panorama that results from it. So before we embarked on the full HMMA full scale with uh, more than 1,300 samples, we did a small pilot project just to see if the samples were appropriate for this kind of study, and we did a pilot project on 10 NGSA samples that came from a diverse diversity of regions and geological environments across Australia, and we just wanted to confirm that, yes, 
there is a rich diversity of uh, heavy minerals, so there is a rich ecosystem, if you like, uh, and the, the assemblages tend to uh, seem to be uh, appropriate for the geological environments that we were in. There were some correlations between, for example, the geochemistry, uh, zirconium, and the, number, the, the zircon counts. Uh, there was associations, for example, of uh, tin minerals, tin sulfides, etc., where we knew that there was thin granites in the catchments, etc., etc. And we also, during this pilot phase, developed a mineral network analysis tool, which I'll talk about um, uh, at the end of the talk. And so this pilot project was published in Mills earlier this year. So progress to date, uh, we started in 2021, it will conclude in 2023. Uh, we are collaborating with the uh, John DeLater Center at Curtin University, and we have now processed all 13 and 15 samples from the NGSA. So that in entails heavy mineral separation, mounting, polishing, TMA analysis, and the only thing that's not completely finished now is the QAQC. We are about 80% through. We have identified more than 160 heavy minerals or minerals in, in general in this uh, process. We had the first partial data release for the DCDs. That's a uh, darling Conamona de la Mer in the region that was done at uh, an, a meeting in July. And today we are presenting the second partial release for the big region, so the Barclay, uh, Isa, Georgetown region. I'm sorry, I'm pointing at one screen, but that, that one is <laughs> much harder to aim for. Uh, and so the, 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 what we hope to get today is, is a little bit of feedback, if you can send us an email or anything, that would uh, to get uh, hints or uh, tips about how we can make uh, the, the final data release even more useful for you. Uh, so a little bit about Bing. Uh, it's one of the uh, deep dive regions of uh, the EFTF, Exploring for the Future, a major Australian government funded uh, initiative. Uh, that lasts eight years. We're sort of three quarters of the way through at Geoscience Australia. I don't need to tell you much about what, what it is in terms of geology and uh, potential. Uh, we've been talking about that very much today, and uh, we're all aware of this. And what we hope is that the heavy minerals could produce or essentially release, uh, result in a window to basement uh, geology and geological environments that may be uh, under shadow cover. All right, so... Here is the sample that we've used for this big release. So the red outline is the big region from EFTF, and we have gone one degree wider than that because of our super low density to have enough samples. So we have uh, utilized 188 samples from 170 catchments. It's almost a 1 million square kilometer area. And for this big study, we have identified 153 unique minerals, and we have more than 18 million data points. So we can produce maps of heavy mineral distribution, but you know that that's that's tedious. 160 maps. Um, so we, we really needed a, a new tool to be able to deal with 18 million data points for this sub area. What about when we're going to release the full national scale data set? So uh, Evgeny Bestrakov uh, uh, delved into uh, the, the, the development of a mineral network analysis tool that I'll talk about in a minute. And uh, this GA record has been released about a couple of hours ago for this big release today. So uh, you can go and have a look at that for more, more information. So what is mineral network analysis? So it's a subfield of graph theory, and it's been popular for mapping social networks. So here you have a network of Game of Thrones. Uh, each uh, protagonist in the Game of Thrones has its name at a node. The size of the font is uh, directly proportional to the number of scenes on the screen that it appears in. So the, the, the more frequent it appears, the larger the font. The links between uh, the protagonists or the nodes has a thickness that's rel directly relative to the number of frames in which they both occur. So the co-occurrence of these individuals. And the proximity of them is the exclusivity. So, for example, there's very few um, frames where Shay appears without Tyrion, for example. They're always, almost always together. Um, all right, so how do we apply that to minerals? So we use that to uh, visualize the data set, explore relationships extremely quickly. When you think that there are 18 million data points, we can discover heavy mineral associations or co-occurrences, and it has also a very handy little mapping tool that can show you where these mineral in occur or co-occur. And here is a link uh, to the, uh, the heavy mineral tool. I'll show you a QR code at the end. I didn't want to show it now because you wouldn't be listening to me anymore. Uh, but uh, basically, I'll run you through what it, what it can do. 
So when you uh, start the m &A tool, you click, click, click on that link that I showed on the previous slide. This is the, um, the, the default screen that you get. So you can see that you have an area here that's has the big and the DCD, so that's big and that's DCD down here, and the zinc element is also shown by default, uh, otherwise you get a, a really big network. So what we're going to do is, for example, uh, first of all, deselect DCD, because we're talking about big today, this is the release for big, uh, and you can see here the network of the zinc uh, minerals, so there's garnite, zincochromite, ferrohygbomite, etc. The color of these nodes is the mineral class, so oxides uh, uh, in um, yellow, um, uh, alloys in uh, green, etc. And the distance between uh, the, the nodes and the size of the nodes is exactly as I ex uh, showed in the example before. So uh, you can also modify the map so you can uh, have the default uh, on open street map uh, layout. You can also put a topographic map. You can show the geological regions, different size catchments, and you can show deposits. You're going to just show the geological regions. That's what you get. If we now remove zinc, for example, to see all the relationships, you're going to see how this network becomes all of a sudden incomprehensible, unfathomable, right? So that's when you look at all the data sets. So it's, it's you really need something to drill through, to filter through uh, the data. So we'll look, for example, at copper minerals. So you get you get this network. Notice that the map doesn't change until you do some other things that I'll talk about in a minute. And what you do is you can hover your mouse over a mineral and you can see the name, the formula, and the number of samples in which it occurs, in this case, 60. Also a link to mintat.org to have all the metadata that you would dream of about uh, chalcopyrite. And you look at bornite, uh, here you go, there are 17 samples with bornite in them. And you hover over the middle of the over the link and you get a little nine that comes up. That means there are nine samples where they both occur. We can now show the map of chalcopyrite in the big area. We can add the number of observations per sample. So very, this is very, very quick. We can add bornite. And it appears as a pie diagram with bornite and chalcopyrite. And if you want to show a polar area diagram, you click on that area down there, you select from there. And if you want to show only the seven where they're co-occurring, you click on that box and here are the co-occurring samples, or the, co the samples where chalcopyrite and bornite co-occur. You can look at some other uh, elements and minerals. So for example, if we look at if we select tantalum, we get tantalite and struvite, which are the only two minerals that have that we have in the region, tantalum minerals in the region. And this is the map for tantal distribution of tantalite. So from up to nine, well, zero or one grain and up to nine uh, observations in a sample up there in, in the York Peninsula. The Cape York. Um, and this is now struvite. This is one sample with struvite. All right, and if we change that, for example, we look at cassiterite, you get this map here. So that is very, very exciting. One sample there has 300 observations of cassiterite. Not sure what that means, but um, certainly it would be very, very interesting to have to go and have a look over there and have a closer look at that sample as well. Okay, so now we're going to do... Um, you're going to look at cassiterite and tantalite, and there are only four samples where uh, cassiterite and tantalite occur. So the idea is to look at the tin tungsten uh, associations, tin tungsten tantalum, um, and you can see that the four samples where they co-occur are one here, one here, one here, and one up here. So along the Carpentaria coast, pretty much. So remember, remembering that these are catchment outlet sediments, it means that the catchments upstream of these four sites uh, could potentially be useful to have a look at. Okay, so now let's uh, look at tungsten, again in the same frame of mind. Wolframite and scheelite are the minerals that we have. Um, and okay, I had also added here the mineral deposits, so that's all the mineral deposits are these red circles. And what I wanted to show next is that you can filter them uh, to only show the grisons and the scans. And these are those uh, fewer, many fewer sample uh, deposits shown here. And for example, you can also hover on that and you get some more information about uh, the deposit. 
Um, okay, so if you look at, so we've only been using the network and map tab so far. If you look at the data tab, you get the data file uh, for the big area. And uh, you can download it, but bottom right, there's a download button there to download that data set. Um, and op in options, you can uh, do several things. You can change the layout of the network, and you can also filter the deposit types uh, according to this uh, CMMI uh, classification that uh, David Houston just talked about. So there are four levels of filtering uh, cascading through. Um, and in the About tab, you have some general information about the tool and the data sets. All right, so uh, what have been the impacts to date? Uh, so when we released the DCD uh, partial data release in, in July, the a journalist, uh, uh, David Upton, got in touch with uh, Frank Bunting, for, formerly from BHP Exploration, and uh, he, he, he said, Frank said that it's great to see a systematic regional or actually continental scale heavy mineral sampling of drainage systems being undertaken by Geoscience Australia and Curtin. The database of heavy minerals identified uh, by GA and any follow-up work could indeed hold hints of mineralization uh, as yet unrecognized, especially under shallow cover. And a junior zinc, copper, nickel exploration company applied for an exploration license approximately 50 kilometers from Angus in South Australia after noticing this Ghanaite count. So, and, they, and they were a little bit surprised that the ground hadn't been taken up yet because, in fact, it was about a month after the release and they thought everybody would have jumped on it. But they were very happy, very happy to be able to uh, apply for it. Okay, so uh, while I read the conclusions, this is a teaser of where we were at six months ago. I haven't updated it yet, but for a right map, map of Australia. So the, the blue dots are the sound that hadn't been analyzed yet. The little pluses are no observations, and then from green to yellow, an increasing number of right observations. Uh, this is just a little, little teaser. Um, so the heavy mineral map of Australia... Uh, combines a national sample archive that was in our in our warehouse with a mature exploration strategy that is uh, unfortunately not uh, probably under probably underused in Australia and state of the art analytical automated mineralogy techniques um, it's underpinned by a pilot project that demonstrated uh, the suitability of the materials and fine tuned methodology uh, it will deliver the world's first continental scale publicly available heavy mineral map uh, of, uh, and data sets, so it'll essentially be, if you like, like a Clark continental, continental concentration of heavy minerals equivalent. Uh, this has never been done before, and it will be really useful uh, at uh, leveling or comparing or measuring anomalies uh, too. Uh, the collection of polished heavy, uh, the polished heavy mineral mounts uh, will be a geoscientific asset for the community that will be held in perpetuity at Geoscience Australia be available uh, upon a certain number of uh, decisions, I guess, that we still have to think about uh, for uh, mineral uh, microanalysis uh, that will also be facilitated by that reference frame that I showed you for uh, uh, easier uh, relocation on the, on, the map, on the mount. We also developed a bespoke cloud-based mineral network analysis tool. And, and, and that's proven to be extremely useful to very rapidly get uh, essential information out of this huge data set. So the big de partial data set is a second publicly released uh, uh, an accessible tranche of the HMMI data set. And as I said in, uh, before, uh, we really welcome any feedback that you might have about how we can uh, improve this data set and the release uh, when we do the final release next year. And by the way, when we do the final release, we everything will be updated so we will re-release the dcd and the big area it'll be part of the national data set because as we do qaqc and start looking at some uh, drill down into the data a little bit more we might recalculate uh, some mineral compositions and that changes everything and if you have a phone in your holster you can point at that and that'll get you to the mna tool and you can look at that at lunch if you want uh, it's it's a little bit hard on the phone because it uses both cpu uh, on the cloud and on the device it kind of combines both, and uh, it also needs a fairly good uh, uh, internet connection. And with that, I'll leave it to you because I see Evans coming up. Oh, just some more details and uh, a reference list. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any? Do we have any questions from the floor for Patrice? Yeah, <laughs> come across.
Hey, Patrice, that's a great data set. Uh, I was wondering around what you saw in terms of field duplicates for those samples, how reproducible were the minerals, depending... So, we haven't actually done... Uh, we are, we're writing up the methods and we will look at the, the QAQC in terms of field duplicates uh, as part of that. We haven't really had time to do that yet. Yeah, we've, We started this project a year and a half ago and we, we've really been running crazy just getting the data ready so we'll spend the next uh, year to doing it all all these things i think um realistically we'd have to be um thinking about how observations are necessarily comparable we may have to go back to weight over volume percent uh concentration values which we can because we did record a yield factor which is a what the mass of the heavy mineral extract is compared to the mass of the original uh, size fraction. Um, and we also have to bear in mind that uh, the, the duplicates were sometimes collected uh, hundreds uh, of meters apart, and there may well be a difference in the positional setting. I think we'd be happy with observation, with observation and non-observation matching a non-observation. That'd be already a very good test. Now, if you observe three grains in one of the duplicates and six in the other, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy with that. Uh, but if it's three and 300, I'd sort of think that maybe one of them was not taking the right environment. Uh, but having said that, we've done, of course, all the field duplicate uh, checks on the geochemistry. And that's been documented in data quality of the NGSA data quality report. And, uh, you know, it's, it's documented. It's there. It's, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps if you want to keep that conversation going at lunch, um, yep. it'd be a great opportunity. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome up onto the stage Dee Zivak, uh, who's a postdoctoral researcher from the School of Physical Sciences, University of Adelaide. Dee will be talking on neodymium, isotopic evidence for the origin of rare earth enrichment in the Georgina Basin phosphorites. Welcome, Dee. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak today. It's been uh, really great and really quite interesting. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, begin by thanking the um, GSQ for funding this project. So this project was started um, probably beginning of last year, even before, um, looking at the potential of the phosphorite in the Regina Basin as a rare earth element source. And for that, um, I'd like to thank Matthew Valtich, who used to be with GSQ, now is with Anglo-American, and, and Helen as well, who initiated this project. And I sort of took over at, at the beginning um, to try and determine the origin. Um, I also would like to, um, I'd like to begin my talks by acknowledging the traditional owners. And um, in this case, on the Brisbane lands here, we, um, I would like to acknowledge the, uh, the Yagara and uh, Turbo people. I apologize if I mispronounce things, who are the traditional uh, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. And I wish to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I, I do extend that um, respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. But I also would like to acknowledge the Ghana people who are the traditional owners of the land on which I work in Adelaide. So, um, yeah. Um, First of all, why, why are we really interested in the rare earth elements? Um, so, at the moment, Australia is the fourth larger, largest producer of rare earths, and they're used in a variety of new um, technologies that are basically necessary for the transition to net zero. Uh, the, the ambitious plan of getting the, this to a um, net zero carbon by 2050 by the Australian government means that the prices um, of the rare earths are skyrocketing and um, because they're used mainly in the technologies such as magnets that are used in wind farms and, and so on and catalysts and polishing and things like that. So um, although we produce quite a bit of rare earths, um, the supply chains are a bit different in terms of downstream processing. A majority of the um, magnets are produced by China, so they buy, buy up a lot of the rare earths and it'd be nice to see Australia putting a bit of investment towards actually maybe you know, manufacturing side of things. So that's just my two cents worth about that. <laughs> um, but really what I'm here to, to talk about today is a phosphorite and what it is and why do we really want to look into this a bit more. It is a potential source of rare earths, and I think one of the talks today um, mentioned this, uh, um, I think from Dave Houston, which is great. Um, so some of the um, uh, 
phosphorite deposits in um, the Georgina Basin in Queensland here uh, have quite high tonnages of phosphorite at um, sort of these values, as you can see. Um, you know, 0.13 uh, percent at Ardmore is quite high, so that's quite interesting and really good. Um, they are currently mined for phosphate fertiliser, which makes this really interesting because you can mine the rare earths um, or extract rare earths as a byproduct of phosphate fertiliser mining, which is really good. So the cost of mining is fairly cheap. These are quite shallow. Um, they're fairly soft rocks. So no, there's not a lot of um, beneficiation issues. Um, and they are quite rich in phosphor. So the phosphoride typically is uh, what we call a rock that has phosphate contents between 18 to or higher than 18 to 28 percent as a minimum. And the primary mineral um, in the phosphoride is a carbonate fluorapatite. Now, um, in a lot of these um, deposits, there's also a whole bunch of secondary minerals such as clamidite, which I'll touch on a bit in a bit more detail and uh, detail later on, and why that's important. Uh, and uh, some more gang minerals like quartz, calcite, dolomite, and so on. What are they looking? Um, fairly unimpressive, um, <laughs> very creamy coloured, um, sandy looking uh, rocks. Um, this is a, a cross section in the Custine at Arno um, prospect and you see the phosphorite overlain by the shells of the Inca formation. And that's quite interesting and I'll come back to this because it is this transition that is, um, has got high enrichments of rare as well, which I'll touch on a bit later on. When they're fresh, this is from the Duchess Prospect, and I'll show a map of this. I apologise. I realise I should probably put a map before I start talking about this. I just wanted to illustrate what they look like, um, uh, I guess, in the field and in fresh sections. Uh, very hard to recognise it in the drill core. If you um, don't have a, a high logger, you might mistake them for a sandstone or something along those lines. Um, so this is from about 140 metres uh, in under the SCM, you can see that um, they're quite fossil rich in some instances, and all of these fossils might have started as calcite, but have been turned into cal carbonate fluorapatite during phosphatization. Um, when they're fresh, and this is a thin section image, um, this is from a, um, again the Duchess Prospect. Um, you can see calcite as the matrix, and the CFA occur as little pellets, and this is a uh, a type called palatal, so they kind of look like little um, round, so in some instances, wood-like um, pellets um, made up of microcrystalline carbonate fluorapatite. And when they're weathered, they uh, typically have clay and quartz as the matrix. Uh, the non palatal types uh, are usually um, what we call apatite mudstones. Uh, it's essentially just a microcrystalline carbonate fluorapatite. Kind of looks like little stromatolites. Um, so you could have some uh, microbial laminated layers um, as part of that. And quite often occur with glauconite. So how do they form? Um, this is just a very quick schematic to show um, where the phosphate comes from. And I wish to note here that the rare earths in many in instances also behave like phosphate in terms of how they get into the basin. So first, um, we have the highly dissolved um, phosphate, which is highly reactive, um, coming into the marine basin through um, uh, rivers and or groundwater. Uh, and then what we need to do is actually get that phosphate from the water to the bottom sediments. And to do that, um, you can either have other phytoplankton and marine fauna take up the phosphate. You can get absorbed on iron oxyhydroxides or organic matter. And once it settles down to the bottom, the phosphate comes off the, um, uh, I guess, from the organic matter. And uh, in the anoxic environment, also, um, rem it's removed from iron oxyhydroxides and organic matter and um, concentrates in the pore spaces which is where you um, – and calcium comes in also from the water as well as fluorine, which is not on here, and they form the carbonate fluorapatite. So that's a very simplistic diagram. Um, and um, the late stage is what we have is dynamic reworking where you actually have wave action um, and um, water movement as well, concentrating these in some locations by winnowing or moving them. Um, I will note here that I didn't put up the upwelling model, which is where the um, – Phosphate-rich uh, bottom waters from deep oceans uh, uh, basically upwell onto the continent, um, onto the um, 
uh, continental shelves, and that's what also produces, um, uh, I guess, enriches these domains in phosphor as well. The reason I didn't put that up is because Georgina Basin is a epicontinental, um, it will form, formed in epicontinental sea. So this is now a map, finally. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I'll go back. Um, as you can see, there's um, Mount Isa is right there for reference. We've got um, a number of deposits up north in the, in the centre and then Armo, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail down south. Phosphate Hill is currently producing majority of the um, phosphate fertiliser for the area, um, just for the context. Um, the Georgina Basin is Cambrian to division in age. And um, majority of the phosphate is actually concentrated along the margin of this basin. Or I guess majority of the economic deposits, I should say. In terms of total uh, rare earth enrichment in phosphorites, um, there's just a little um, plot here to show a box and uh, whisker plot to show that Armour, in fact, is the highest in the total rare earth con contents, which also include yttrium. Um, and then as you go further sort of to the north, the total rare earth contents decrease. I should note here that uh, as I'll, I'll mention later, majority of the southern um, prospects, so the Duchess and Phosphate Hill, are all pretty much higher than the northern prospects up there. If you look at their patterns, so um, this is going from north to south, and this is normalised to the post-Australian um, uh, post shales. Um, you can see that they're mostly heavy rare earth enriched. Um, still... Um, pretty much, well, not pretty much, but quite similar to the shales. But as we go further south, we get, we see an increase in total concentrations of rare earths, but the patterns remain quite similar, which is really interesting. When we look at what mineral that do the rare earth elements sit in, uh, this is just showing um, a laser spots on the carbonate fluorapatite. Uh, this is, I believe, is dolomite from memory. And what we can see is that the patterns and the in carbonate fluorapatite match those of the bulk rare earths. So we're pretty confident that the, that's where majority of the rare earths sit. And the fact that there's no other minerals apart from that, quartz and calcite, which don't have any rare earths. So what is the origin of, of rare earth enrichment phosphorites? Well, we looked at uh, a number of possibilities. Firstly, um, is a primary. So do we, does do the rare earth compositions of these rocks reflect composition of the seawater from which they formed and bottom sediments at the time of formation? Um, and what actually then controls the rare earth composition of that seawater? And then the secondary possibility is, um, is that these are um, enrichments associated with weathering and formation of crandallite, which I'll go into a bit more detail later on. Or there could also be uh, fault related. So Alice Springs origin affected the southern part of the basin um, during southwest block up movement. So it could be possible that flow, a flow movement along faults can also cause the rare earth enrichment. So we sort of investigated these and um, as I mentioned, I, we used nadimium isotopes and strontium isotopes, which I haven't received yet. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll leave them out. I'll just talk about the nadimium isotopes. Well, firstly, we also wanted to test the primary enrichment um, and we looked at the composition of modern day seawater and uh, in terms of rare earths and what the patterns look like. And if you have a look, so this is the composition of the modern day seawater from these sources and the patterns are quite similar to those that we observe in the phosphorites. So that makes us think, well, it's possible that this does reflect seawater composition. I should note that the levels, the total concentrations of uh, rare earths in seawater are 10 to the minus 6. <laughs> so they're, they're basically 1,000 a, a to 10,000 times less than what they are in these rocks. A million times, sorry. Um, the other control that it, it, well, the other thing that might be controlling the rare earth composition is the type of the phosphorite. So the palletal phosphorites are typically high in rare earths compared to the non paleal types, and that could be due to the higher surface-to-mass ratio, which is more favourable uh, to for incorporation of rare earths into this uh, crystal lattice of the carbonate fluorapatite. So that is because there's a difference in terms of the 
type of the phosphorite in the north and centre compared to the south, that could be the potential reason to explain the, the differences. Um, but we also wanted to know whether there's a basement control on, on the river earth enrichment in these rocks. And if you have a look at the north, they, they sit on the sandstones and sandstones, I think, in the McNamara group. And then in the south, we have the Sabella Bathlith, which is quite rich in rare earths, and I'll show that in a minute. And also um, a whole bunch of other rocks that are quite enriched in rare earths as well. So we then went out and analysed a number of sample, basement samples from these um, domains just to see what is the total rare earth concentration of these rocks. Again, I should note that this is normalised chondrite, not um, Arakean shales. And if we, <coughs> sorry, and if we have a look, well, <coughs> <laughs> Pardon me. The Sabella granites um, are quite um, enriched in rare earths compared to the <clears throat> the silstones and sandstones, and this is a Corella um, calcite sample. So, <clears throat> thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Too much talking. Um, so um, we went and, set and analyzed a, <clears throat> a whole bunch of phosphorites for nidumium isotopes um, in these rocks, and we did this at the LA University. We have facilities there that do a really good job. And um, I wanted to reconstruct what this domain looked like, um, you know, 505 million years ago and when these rocks formed. And this is taken from the um, Scotese um, publication, through the Earth Bites group. And this is where the Georgina Basin phosphites sit at this time. Um, and then I tried to find other samples that have any be my soaps uh, from around, I guess, the area. And I uh, managed to find some samples from the uh, Flinders Ranges and South China Sea. They're slightly older than the phosphites. But if I plot on uh, the basement, oh, sorry. If I plot the basement near Demium isotopes, you can see that they're quite less, much less radiogenic than the um, than the actual phosphorites, which makes me think actually the basement does not control the total rare earth concentration in these rocks. But if I look at the um, Flinders Ranges phosphates and the South China phosphates, they're actually quite they're a little bit more close to the basement composition. So it could be that there's an evolution uh, of the seawater isotopic composition with age in these rocks. I'm just still thinking about what could be explaining this, but what I know for certain now is that the basement is not controlling the total rare earth composition of these rocks. Um, I then looked at the um, whole rock data in terms of major and trace element geochemistry to see what the difference between the northern and central phosphorites and the southern phosphorites uh, might be. And as you can see, this is PCA analysis, which basically shows which uh, elements control the majority of the composition in these rocks. And the um, northern and central prospects are dominated by the uh, more terrigenous materials, um, such as clays, heavy um, materials, and heavy minerals. As you can see, there's a um, higher, uh, they're more associated with um, zirconium, niobium, uh, which are found in heavy minerals. So there's a greater terrigenous input into the um, phosphorites that are further north into the centre, whereas the southern phosphorites are more associated with the uh, elements that go into the carbonate fluorapatite mineral lattice, which makes me think that the rare earth enrichment in these is in fact due coming from the seawater itself. So just as a conclusion, basement appears to play a very minor, if any, role in total rare earth con concentration of these rocks. So th could there be secondary um, r reasons for rare earth enrichment in these rocks? And one of those being weathering. Um, so I'll show you a, a profile of what the uh, Ardmore Costian that I showed before looks like in terms of total rare earth concentrations and the underlying palletal phosphorites. Um, so this, again, um, is just showing that transition, and that's the contact between the shales and the, the blazer shale. Yeah, it is. Oh, I'm trying to think of information. Um, so um, cranolite forms close to the boundary between these two uh, uh, in this transition, 
And uh, we found some xenotin that we dated as well, uh, which shows that the um, weathering in the, um, these is quite recent. Um, so between, I mean, it's terrible data, so don't look at the errors, Elena, please don't look at the errors. Um, but the rare earth element concentration in some of these um, profiles can reach up to 1.75 weight percent uh, total rare earth oxide. Um, if you look at the now the um, concentration of rare earths as we go, so number one uh, re corresponds to this number one on the um, on these graphs, and that's the sampling that we did. And you can see that oops, sorry, that the rare earth concentrations increases uh, in this transition zone, so between sample seven, six, and five, and then it goes into sort of more steady concentrations down below. And this uh, zone is quite rich in cranolite and gauze exite um, as well. And if we look at the rare earth patterns, um, you can see that these are quite rich in heavies, which are more desirable in terms of rare earth uh, production. And then increases, but more in the light so than the heavies, really. And then as you go further away from the boundary, it decreases quite significantly. So... This it suggests certainly that the weathering does play a major role in concentrating these um, in this zone. And when we looked at uh, the distribution of the heavies to lights in the crandalite, which is the uh, rare earth rich zone versus the uh, carbonate fluoroapatite, and this is from the Ardmore section as well, samples from Ardmore, you can see that the heavies typically sit in the carbonate fluoroapatite rather than the crandalite. Crandalite's more rich in the light rare earths. And some of these probably reflect xenotheme inclusions. So to conclude, um, origin rare earths in, in the phosphorus appears to be primary and likely reflects the seawater um, nadimium isotope composition at the time of their position. And there is a slight difference between the northern and central prospects um, uh, that are slightly less radiogenic, which possibly suggesting the impact of this uh, high terrigenous material in the northern and central prospects. And the absolute concentrations of rare earths uh, that vary between the different prospects are most likely due to textural differences. So the polyethyl phosphorites are richer in rare, rare earths and likely to also um, be due to secondary processes like weathering. Um, and um, just as a side note, the Corella prospect that's south of the uh, uh, phosphate hill has very high concentrations of rare earths, and especially yttrium in that transition zone. So that's quite interesting. And just what's going on at the moment. So we are obtaining the remaining of the, the rest of the strontium isotopes um, as we speak. And uh, on Monday, I'll be doing some lasering of the um, weather profile across the Ardmore, as well as um, uh, this is quite funny. We managed to find samples of phosphorite from Paradise South in our crypt at Adelaide from 1970s. I have no idea where these came from. They're labelled Lady Annie. I don't know who they were sent to. Um, so it's the only um, actual whole samples that I have from the Paradise South or former Lady Annie prospect that I'm actually going to be analysing as well. So that's quite interesting. Anyway, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks, Dee. We do have one question online from Joe Joan Estelle. Is there an enrichment vector towards the faults? Um, I don't know. Um, sorry. Unfortunately, we did not uh, look at spatial uh, correlation to where the faults are. I know certainly at Armour when we did field work, we did find a lot of these breccia zones that were um, quite interesting uh, in terms of um, just the way they look and their orientation. However, we don't actually know. Um, I can't answer that question because we haven't sampled that to, for that specific question. So that's something that we really need to look into into the future for sure. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd now like to call up the last presenter for this session, uh, Carl Spandler, Associate Professor from the University of Adelaide. Carl will be talking on the geology and critical metal ore potential of the Peaks Ranges, Central Queensland. Welcome, Carl. This looks pretty simple. Right. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm thanks, Evan, for the introduction. I'm talking about peak ranges, and I had this slide here de deliberately um, to show you how nice the place is. Uh, and for those of you who've been in, know this already, but if you haven't been there and you're ever heading north of Emerald or east of Claremont, it's worth uh, driving through this way to have a look. Most of this is on pastoral land, but some of it is national park. And so if you like uh, hiking, it's a really nice place to go, although there are no trails, so it's um, hiking through the bush. Anyway, uh, it's also got fascinating geology, and it also has interest for critical minerals, which is what I'm talking about. So this is a project that's ongoing with Uni Adelaide. Um, it was really started, myself and Ross Chandler, the, the last author on here, when I was at JCU, and has been continuing with uh, some... All honor students, and now is this a laser pointer? Nope. Laser, that's the laser pointer. With uh, Funny Muse, who's a postdoc, part time postdoc at, um, at Adelaide. All right. Uh, so, a bit of context around this. Why, why are we looking at this, and why, why is this interesting from a, a critical minerals perspective? Uh, we know that Eastern Australia has a lot of uh, Mesozoic and younger alkaline volcanics which is shown here some of them relate to these oops wrong one these uh, long hotspot tracks that people know a lot about Ooh. this is my laser pointer okay oh thanks um so these uh, so that so the dashed blue lines I'll, I'll try and explain it better then dashed blue lines are these uh, hotspot tracks the best known is the cosgrove one in the west there um, but they're also older volcanics, so they're mostly the, the, the Cenozoic ones, but there are other volcanics, Mesozoic ones, and the one I've got highlighted there, Tungai, is of particular interest because it is enriched in a whole bunch of what we call rare metals, uh, including the zirconium, hafnium, niobium, tantalum, and rare earths. So this has been worked up by Alkane and then their spin-off company, Strategic Australian Strategic Minerals or Metals, um, and they're probably going to be one of the next on, um, major producers of critical minerals in Australia. Uh, and that's hosted in a Mesozoic trachyte, um, pre-alkaline trachyte. And so that means is there potential for more of these things across eastern Australia. And so there's lots of work going on in this space now. So in New South Wales, there's a, a bit of an uh, initiative to map out the potential of these alkaline rocks through New South Wales. Up here in Queensland, we've got Juice Q with Dave Purdy are working in these areas, Mount Hedlow and Mount Ramsey and more broadly, and they're, they're showing quite a bit of potential. There's work uh, south of where it says Peak Ranges. It's Springshore by uh, um, Scott Bryant and people at QUT. And uh, there's other there's other work going on as well. Yeah, UQ are working on the more processing aspects of this as well. Uh, so we're working up there where it says peak ranges, uh, and this started a few years ago with an honors project by Ross Chandler, who's now doing a PhD at ANU. And he, through that work, we identified some some of these volcanic complexes that may be prospective, and that's that. Ground has now been picked up by companies uh, looking for deposits. Uh, and we've also got, uh, thanks to GSQ and the Queensland government, a NEMI grant to keep working on peak ranges to try and understand the geology there better and the metal potential. And that's partly because there'd been very little work uh, on these rocks in the past. So this is uh, Ross's work um, so let's start, whoops, wrong one, sorry, can I go back? Yep. Start with the little inset there, you can see the, um, this little box is where we are. It's, uh, in, true, well, it's, it's um, in place through the Bowen Basin, and we think it's actually located, it's, the location is pretty much where the boundary between the Thompson and the New England origins are, and I think that's quite important because these structures would probably be really important in terms of channelizing these melts through the lithosphere. 
It also probably corresponds to a, a step in the lithosphere, and Dave Houston talked about that today for mineral deposits are really important. And that's certainly true for Tungi, and I think it's probably true here as well. That's a bit of a, a bigger story. Zooming in, we see um, the, the volcanics themselves. So most of the volcanics here are basalts, as many of these Cenozoic um, systems are. They're, they're outpourings of basalts, but they're not the interesting rocks in this case. And most of the previous work has been done on the basalts. We're interested in the more felsic uh, rocks, which are the ones that stick out of the ground and make these nice, this uh, amazing landscape. In terms of uh, the way it's broken up, so there's a belt of these more evolved uh, silicic rocks running up and down through here. Uh, in the south where this box is, is where Ross worked, um, but they uh, there's a bunch of these little round domes and plugs in here, but they extend all the way up through here to this area up in the north where there's this uh, purple and pink thing. They surround that. The purple and pink thing is actually uh, some of the Thompson Origin basement that is that has been exposed. A little dome complex coming through there, with granites, um, uh, probably Ordovician to Devonian granites in the middle in pink. So Ross's work really. So if we go in onto this box and that's blown up here at the top, we see these are the samples that Ross worked on. You can see he only worked on a relatively small number of these domes and you can see each of them they're color coded because each of them have a different geology each one in themselves is fairly uniform in terms of the rock types but they're all quite different uh, but when you look at the geochemistry of them they actually tie together very nicely in a, a fairly um, a simple relatively simple crystal fractionation story um, and the other nice thing about them is that we do see, as the plot at the bottom shows, as, as you go through these rocks from the, say, least evolved, the, the trachytes, up to the most evolved, which are these agerine rhyolites, so sodic uh, pyroxene-bearing rhyolites, the zirconium and niobium shown here as the red metal contents go up um, a lot. And so half a percent zirconium in an igneous rock is a lot of zirconium. Uh, and so that's that's what's uh, attracted the interest from from explorers in this area. But you can see also that's that so that was Ross's honours work, a pretty amazing job for an honours. But there's lots more to do here. So all of these domes were not really looked at recently, and all of the domes and volcanics heading up to the north uh, have also not really been studied in any detail, it's, uh, particularly at the um, the more evolved. Uh, fills again to these volcanics. Um, so more recent work. So this is uh, Mistral's honours work from last year. She was working on this area just south of that um, basement window there, uh, produced a map and again showed that's shown here that, that each of these volcanic systems is a, is a unique little body. Um, that's just a few pictures of the rocks. The one I want to point out here, there's lots of them here. You don't need to know much about them. Um, but that one there, sort of in the medium blue, is interesting. Mount Donald, that's the biggest peak in that northern part of the dome uh, of the belt. And that is uh, a little bit different compared to all the others in the north here. And you'll see that has more similarities to the south than the north. Uh, what have we got next? So Geochron. Geochron's a little bit interesting here because this is part of that Cosgrove hotspot track. So if we have a simple model where we have a hotspot and the Australian plate moving over it, we should essentially have all the volcanics in this area the same age. But previous work, uh, mostly based on the mafic rocks, has shown there is actually a bit of an age spread. In fact, there's probably episodes of magnetism here going from 47 down to 26. That's really on the mafic rocks. Uh, we're interested in the, in the more felsic rocks. Uh, the only work that had been done on, in terms of geochron in the area previously was some of these peaks in the, the centre and the south that came up with about 30 million year age. So we thought we'd better check if some of these northern rhyolites were the same age and they turn out they are. So we got some good zircon yields out of these and they basically come out at 30 million years as well. So we're pretty confident that there is for the more silicic end of the of the magnetism here, it corresponds to a single event or near single event around 30 million years ago. And the other interesting thing here is this no inheritance. Um, they're all magmatic zircons um, at 30 million years. And that's interesting. You'll see why that's interesting in a moment. 
So Mistral also dated some of the granite here, so that uh, granite in the core of that little dome there, uh, which is the Murramin granite. It's an S-type granite, uh, and these are the zircon ages that came out of that. Basically, probably none of these are magmatic or magmatic related to the emplacement of the granite. They're probably all inherited, and they go back three billion years ago, a full spread down to around 400, which may be getting close to the emplacement age. Simply, that's telling us that we have old crustal basement here. It's consistent with this being an S-type granite that has melted old basement. So moving on to where we are now, so we've done field campaigns over the last few years to try and sample and look at all of these different domes to get a good idea of the, the magmatic geology over the entire belt. So this is just the uh, GCHEM data we now have from various different theses works and subsequent field work as well as uh, pre-existing data. So the the Jones et al. work here, the blue circles, they are mostly basalts. We're not particularly interested in those. The previous, the major previous study in this area was in 1965 by Molan, so quite old, but there's quite a few samples from across the belt as well. And we wanted to go and fill in that and analyze this, uh, get some new data on all of these, um, these different plugs and domes and lava flows. Uh, and we've got a pretty good spread of it now. So I'm just going to show some geochem to, uh, well, basically it demonstrates a pretty simple uh, outcome of this. So what I've done here, these are sort of like Harker scatter plots, but they're not at all because we've got uh, a single axis on the vertical axis here, which is this PI per alkaline index, which essentially is the ratio of sodium plus potassium divided by alumina. And what, the reason why that's important is because they're the main components that go into feldspar. So at the felsic end, as you go from mafic to felsic, the thing that dominates crystal fraction is feldspar fractionation. And sodium plus potassium to alumina ratio in a feldspar is fixed at one. So if you're fractionating feldspar and your melt has more alumina than, than sodium potassium, then the residual melt as you fractionate will increase in the residual alumina, which means in this in this case, it'll go down. The other way around, if you have excess alkalis and you fractionate feldspar, then the alkali content will continue to increase. This is really important from a mineralization point of view because per, per luminous magmas, so they're the ones with less than one here, are uh, not prospective for rare metal mineralization. Okay, you might want to look at these sort of magmas for pegmatites, although the volumes here are probably too small. But if you're looking for rare earth, zirconium, hafnium, et cetera, you want these guys, the peralkaline ones. And that's because those metals stay in the liquid for longer during fractionation, and you can build them up. In uh, voluminous liquids, you, you fractionate things like zircon, and it leaves the melt. Okay, so that's in some ways is our fertility index. What we see, all of the dots that are the orange colour are from the southern volcanics. Uh, and as you go to the high silica end, which is the most fractionated, what we see is it very much clearly goes up into the peralkaline end. Whereas the, all the volcanics in the north, all the rhyolites in the north, which are the blue dots, it's very much in the peraluminous end. And the other plots are basically just showing you that very nice division between the two sets um, between the two areas quite clearly. The last plot here, which is titanium, I put there just to show that these are really fractionated. So we're talking irrespective if you're north or south, you've got about 0.1% TO2, which is really low. And that's a function of fairly extreme fractionation in both cases. All right, in terms of the metal contents or the rare metals, it's a pretty simple story. As I said, more peralkaline, the more metals you get it into the the liquids, and you can see that here with the zirconium going up, niobium and yttrium as well, representing the rare earths. The northern rhyolites are very low in all of these guys. There's a couple here which is sitting higher, the, the, the blue dot sitting higher, and that's that Mount Donald complex which I mentioned earlier, which is a bit different from the others in the, um, in the northern air end. Okay, what have we got next? So... The story here, and this is really Ross's story, we've just fleshed it out more with more data in the south, is that we have these peralkaline liquids, they're 
um, they reach these really high metal contents through very extreme fractionation. Then mantle derives, so this is Ross's neodymium isotope data, and what we see is that irrespective of the rock type or the zirconium content, in which case, which we can use as a fractionation index, they all sit around three. So that's really telling us we're coming from the same source magma, which is a mantle uh, source. Um, and so now how do the other rocks compare to that? Uh, some new data that we've got coming in. Hello. Yep, so there's Mount Donald, this anomalous body in the north. Uh, we've got two data points which sort of split that um, array for the southern volcanics in half, but essentially in a broad sense it's consistent with being a similar source to the southern volcanics. And then the northern volcanics, which are all these dots down here, they're all very low in, in zirconium, but that's not actually low. That's pretty normal for a magmatic rock. It's that all these other guys are really high. And they're all sitting around zero, uh, zero um, epsilon neodymium. And there's probably more than a dozen samples in there from a whole range of these domes in the north. They're all plotting on top of each other. They're all the same. And what this is telling us is we have two different sources here. So neodymium isotopes are not affected by fractionation. If we've got these differences here, the fundamental source uh, that led to these magmatic rocks has got to be different. And I've said isotopically more crustal, that's relative to the southern ones, which are very mantle-like. Uh, they're peroluminous magmas in the north, and many people often say peroluminous equals a crustal melt. That's kind of a, a bit of a paradigm. So are these crustal melts? Not exactly, because that crust there, the Thompson origin underneath, if we model this, we see this is it here. This is what we would expect it to be. We project that four to 30 million years ago, which is when the magnetism was forming, and we get uh, an epsilon neodymium about minus 15. So if these northern rhyolites were just crustal melts, they would have that same signature. So they're not just crustal melts. There's the southern volcanics up here, plus three. That's consistent with a, a nice and rich mantle source. The northern rhyolites sitting here about zero, and what our model for this is that these were essentially similar melts, uh, mantle melts, as that we see in the southern uh, volcanics, but then during emplacement evolution in the crust, they've been contaminated with some of this basement to about 15% to cause that shift. Uh, and that contamination will also shift it from having a peralkaline uh, fractionation path. It'll switch it over to being peroluminous, which then kills any chance of it being prospective for rare metals. All right, so very quickly to wrap up what we think is going on here. So there is, this is um, fairly widely considered to be related to this plume the Cos of the Cosgrove hotspot track passing under this area 30 million years ago. What we think is that the, the, this is one of the biggest outpourings of magma related to this plume in the whole belt. Uh, there is evidence to, to suggest that the Australian plate may have been slowing down a little bit at this time. There's collisional events up in Proto New Guinea at the time. And so if we had slight slowing down of the, the plate, we've got more opportunity for that plume to be sitting under the crust for longer. We get the doming at the surface, which is now expressed by this little window into the, the um, Thompson origin. And we get pouring out of basalts, which is most of the magmas in the area. Um, and lots of opportunity for that crust to heat up through magma emplacement and just the stalling of the of the plume underneath there. So we get crystal fractionation going on, um, and, but because of that elevated geothermal gradient in the crust, you get a lot more opportunity for assimilation. So as these things are evolving, they're assimilating crust and you're wiping out that rare metal potential. And then uh, the southern peak ranges uh, forms more distally, so it's down here, and it's either related to slightly maybe when the, the plate starts moving again, or it's more distal from where the, 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 the core of the plume was sitting, therefore it doesn't have that um, thermal history in the crust or that elevated thermal, thermal um, conditions, and so you get crystal fractionation to these extreme levels without any um, crustal contamination, and so it remains... Uh, fertile for these rare metals all the way to the end till it, it erupts as these domes. Yeah. Um, and that's the story, essentially.
uh, where we are at the moment with it. I think I'll leave it there. That's it, yeah. Thanks very much, Carl. Do we have any questions from the room? One at the back, Nick. Are there any of these um, volcanics that head towards the Nephilim normative, so the alkaline sites, rather than the tholeitic and quartz normative? Um, at peak ranges, no. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I can't go back. Anyway, uh, yeah, so you, you might have noticed that there's a bit, a bit of a belt that goes maybe three, 400 kilometres from the coast, and that, again, comes back to the lithosphere thickness. So lithosphere is relatively thin. They think um, this has allowed those magmas to come through. There's a few places where you go further inland and the lithosphere is thicker, and you do get much more alkaline um, magmas there, but very small volumes. And there, there is a little bit, I don't know if there's any studies on those, but there is people picking those up as exploration targets at the moment. Yeah. yeah. One more question. I was just wondering if you're going to uh, use the zircon hafnium isotope to resolve your idea on the mixing between crustal and mantle sources rather than having totally different distinct sources. Um, do you plan that so you just confirm your ideas? That's a good idea. Uh, we haven't, we weren't planning on doing that, but we could do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, that wraps up our session before lunch. So in a moment, we'll break. Um, for those in the room, if you could be back in by 1.25, please. We'll start back at 1.25. Those that are online, um, we're actually going to end the session for the online participants now, and then we'll open back up at 1.25. The recording will be um, split into two. So those that are online, please come back. Um, we're going to finish the morning session and then use that same link to re-enter at 1.25. Thank you.